All right. So many people have contacted us and asked us to get female prison stories on the channel. A lot of you were blown away by the story of Natalie Welsh in the Venezuelan prison, whereby she arrived and she looks up at the roof. She sees all the armed men patrolling and she thinks they're the guards and they were the, they were the gang members. <laughs> and that was just the beginning. Anyway, I have published um, Natalie's book. It's available worldwide on Amazon, including an audiobook. But yeah, it's really important to get female voices out there. If you look at the prison populations all over the world, the vast majority of them are men. And, you know, things like Orange is the New Black, I know it's dramatized, but it's, it's good that female stories are getting out there. So this is our very first female prisoner from the UK system. So really appreciate Paris for coming on. And I did discover her through the Delinquent Nation channel. Now, people are at home during lockdown, just gagging for prison stories and content and great interviews. I urge people to go over to the Delinquent Nation channel. Actually, in the description box, I'm going to put the link in for Paris's interview. So perhaps you could start with that one. I was watching um, Billy, what was his name? Billy Miyagi. Billy Miyagi on the way down here today. Another, another great um, podcast on Delinquent Nation. So shout out to the guy running that, um, Mitri, a.k.a. SP. And perhaps you would like to come on here and tell your story, SP. We would really appreciate that. All right, then. So thank you very much for coming on, Paris. Before we get to the prison story, then, do you want to just tell us a bit about your background, what it was like for you growing up? Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, so me growing up, um, so to begin with, it was just me and my mom. Um, my mom's white, my dad is black, Jamaican. Um, how did they meet? They met at a place called, so in Bristol, there's these, uh, like illegal type of bars called blues. Oh yeah. 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 So they had met there and, um, at that point in my mom's life, she was convinced that um, she couldn't have children. And she had met my dad. And apparently my mom was in like a bad way where she was upset and drinking and whatnot. <clears throat> and my dad said, oh, don't worry, I'll give you a baby. And just like that, I, I came about, um, I was made after three months, I think it was. Yeah. But um, unbeknownst to my mom, my dad has a lot of children. So it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal for him. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So he was he was um, prolific, yeah, in the art of um, raise, producing kids. Let's say, yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah, he's very yeah. good at that. I'll okay. give him that. <laughs> <laughs> so, was he seeing your mom not exclusively then? No, not exclusively. Okay. Um, you know they have love for each other just because you know of me, but outside of that, my mom would say that she was never like really in love with him. Yeah, she's always in love with my stepdad, who she was with before my dad who my younger sister's dad is, they end up getting back together. Ah. So, yeah. So did that step that then raise you? Um, yeah, I would say maybe about half of my life, a little yeah. bit less than half of my life. Um, how can I explain it? So he came back into my life when I was about three. I remember seeing him for the first time. I was thinking, who the f is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then, um, and then my sister came along when I was four and a half. And they, they ended up breaking up when I was about, say about 10. Yeah. And then from there, my mom did the single parent thing with two daughters instead of one. So your natural dad was mostly absent. Yeah, he was in prison. Okay. And um, growing up in Bristol for you, what was like that mixed race? Um, it, was, it was quite traumatic to be fair, because as again, my mom's white, but she doesn't come from a diverse background as in the area that she grew up in. So naturally she raised me in a place called Hartcliffe in Bristol. And, um, you know, as I said before, I was like one of the only black children in that whole area. So the moment I would start going to school, that's when I started to realize there was a lot of racial abuse. Um, I remember my first day of school, actually, my mom said, you know, when you get your school uniform on and your mom wants to take a picture. Yeah. And I remember my mom looked at me and she was like, they're going to be picking on you. And I didn't, 
because I was so young and so innocent, I didn't understand what she meant. I just had this image of people picking the skin off my back. And uh-huh. then, yeah. Uh-huh. And then when I, got, when I got into school, obviously I realized what she was talking about. Yeah. So, yeah. So did you have to get like tough fast under those circumstances? Yeah. So um, for a period of time, I was coming home crying. Oh, they're saying, they're calling me chocolate bar. They're calling me, they're calling me X, Y, Z. And um, my mom would always say, tell the teacher. But still to this day, I do believe that the teachers were probably just as racist as the children. Really? Because when I go and tell them, they would say, oh, you're lying, you know? And then I remember one day quite clearly, I came home the usual crying. Mm. And my mom just got frustrated and she was like, if you don't start beating people up, when you get home, I'm going to beat you up. (laughs) So I don't want to hear the crying no more. You need to do something about it. But um, one thing I can say about my mom is that when I started doing that, my mom always had my back. Yeah. As in like, if I was writing lines or something like that, she would just, she would, well, you got to do what you got to do type of thing. Yeah. So I moved schools a lot and then eventually ended up going to a school that was more diverse. And my mom was so determined to make my schooling better that we used to walk like two miles a day there, two miles and back two miles. Because my mom didn't drive, you see. Wow. So, so yeah. So some people are fighters. Some people don't have it in them. So to go from crying then to standing up for yourself, how did you muster that courage? Did you have it in you as a warrior? I just remember, um, it's going to sound petty, but it, as a child, it hurts. I just remember, because I was the, I, at this particular school, I was the only black child. Like there were no, it was all just white. I was the only black child. So no Pakistani, no, no nothing. And um, in the 90s, you had this thing where you would have like tuck, where you'd have, you know, your carton of milk and you'd have a couple of biscuits. And me being the loner that I was, I was walking along in the playground with my bourbon biscuit. <laughs> and this little boy had said, oh, no wonder why she's so black. And something just like clicked in me. And I just remember running towards him and strangling him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I just remember <laughs> strangling him. And then from there, that's when I had just had the courage, like even as a, a look, I would just go in for a fight. I, d- I didn't even have any... Um, you know, break times, I was always writing lines. But looking back now as an adult, no teacher actually sat down and said, why, why are you doing this? Mm. You know, they just branded me as a bad kid. Mm, assholes. We love these stories. That was brilliant. <laughs> um, so I was told that you had a grandfather who was a racist. Yeah. Yeah, my grandfather was racist. Um, <clears throat> so so my mom's, my, mom, my mom's background is quite, uh, she doesn't come from like a loving environment. And um, my granddad was quite, well, he wasn't quite, he was violent. So he used to beat my mom over leaving lights on. Like my mom has caps as teeth because he's knocked her teeth out and stuff before. So um, so she c- came out of the household when she was about 13. So, um, you know, she maneuvered through life her way, how she survived or whatever. And um, when she found out she was pregnant, she had called my granddad and she said, oh, um, I'm pregnant. And he was like, oh, what's that for? So time she stamp, just- put... Time stamp these N words. <laughs> we, get, we get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, no, um, of with course. YouTube. Of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. She just hanged up the phone and um, yeah, he never held us. I don't think I ever heard him say my name before, to be fair. But um, but yeah, my mom just had the attitude of, well, she, she'll do it herself type of thing, you know? So, yeah. so yeah, so yeah, he was a racist. I think there was like a very old generation but like they considered it almost normal, sadly, yeah. to be like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Um, fortunately, times have changed. And what about crime? Did crime impact you as a young person? Um, Were you around people who committed any crimes? Or, um, I mean, so going back to Hartcliffe, Hartcliffe is, uh, you know, you always hear about ghettos and people always think about black people. But Hartcliffe is a white ghetto, so <laughs> there was uh, there was a lot of like drugs around. It's quite normal to see people like you know sniffing cocaine and stuff like that. Um, so I'd say that I was desensitized to drugs. You know, like seeing you know blatant drug users walking around trying to get trying to sort their fix out, basically. Yeah. Um, but in terms of crime outside of that, my stepdad used to dabble in that of crime. Um, he used to do. Uh, he used to work for. It used to be called cable tell and uh he used to chip the boxes <laughs> so you would get like you know free yeah free 
What would it be called then? So say Free Sky. Can you so remember this, James? This is back in your era, isn't it? <laughs> Cable, yeah. Black box with One of the other red. Black boxes. Yeah, you with get red writing. Access it for free. <laughs> oh, you paid for it. Yeah, no. No felonies been admitted today. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so my stepdad used to chip those boxes, and we used to, you know, we used to bundle it in the car, and you go around the house and tune it in and yeah. whatnot. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. My mum used to shoplift to provide for me when I was a baby because, as I said, she was by herself. She didn't have any support. Um, but no real, real, you know, crime is in anything that was traumatizing, if that makes sense. There wasn't much money coming into the household when you were really young. No. 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 And somebody was pimping as well yeah so my my real my real father your natural father yeah my natural yeah, father yeah. he used to be a pimp okay hence why he's got so many children how many's he got so he says it's 14 14 14 that you, with that you 10. know that you know that, yeah that i know of but um do you like speak to them and stuff like uh, half siblings and stuff yeah yeah um yeah. i speak to the majority of them but some of them some of those not interested for obvious reasons mm. you know some people don't like the fact of you know some people can't um get over the fact your dad's been absent me on the other hand yeah. i understand my dad has his own circumstances as to why he's done what he's done you know yeah yeah um but yeah but my aunt said before that there was 23 but my dad said oh no that's lies it's not wow. 23 but i don't think he knows himself yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i don't think he knows oh himself goodness. how did your dad end up going to prison for murder when you were around seven so um I don't know the story behind it 100%, but he had killed the guy with a gun and um, he shot him in the head. And uh, Was that over drugs or something? I don't know. The papers said that it was over gambling. Gambling. Yeah, yeah but um, I don't know. I don't, I don't like to believe that that's the case because I think that's not... A reasonable explanation to kill someone but then what's the reasonable explanation to kill someone period you know yeah but um but yeah no I'd, i've never actually sat down and asked my dad about it i tried to see him on the other side rather than what yeah. he was like in his younger years well in american prison debts are probably one of the leading causes of murder and violence yeah There's people running up gambling debts drug debts yeah um so i could see something like that going down but the media they just say yeah. anything don't they yeah exactly so you just seem very level-headed and self-aware and well-spoken. Thank you. But you've gone through all this trauma. Yeah. How was it impacting you in your earlier years? The, 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 you know, the your dad's not there and the racism and everything. How are you holding it together as a young person? Um, I would say that I was a very angry child, to be yeah. fair. Um. That's why I'd, when I said that, you know, just giving me the wrong look, I'll be like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fuck them up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so um, I would say I handled it through fighting, to be fair. Um, yeah, there's there's not. I mean, I was quite a normal. I was quite a normal kid. All I really wanted to be is just accepted. Yeah. So and then uh, actually I had um, I'd met my best friend who I'm still friends with now. Mm -hmm. Her name was Chantel. I met when I was about eight and she's also half black yeah so um so then we it was like we were like a team then like wherever i was she was so without did, that support did I people don't know. still challenge the team oh yeah oh yeah definitely any memorable fight stories from back then um you mean as a child or as yeah a yeah from the racist picking on you guys and what happened um i remember so there's one i remember one story um back to that school that i was the only black child in yeah there was a girl called lisa and she used to say, I'm going to get my brothers. I'm going to get my brothers to come and beat you up. <sighs> and I remember having anxiety at the gate. Like, oh, my God. Because they, they, um, they were already in secondary school. And I was in, like, year two. Oh, pieces of shit. Yeah. And um, one thing my mom said to me, like, if, you, if there's someone bigger than you, you didn't use something to hit them with. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't I wanna... like the sound of your mom. <laughs> yeah, no, my mom's, my mom's really strong. <laughs> Strong-minded. And, yeah, she can fight as well. Um, but, yeah, I remember... Uh, so what happened was she was just, I'm going to get my brothers to come and beat you up. And I was walking home because it wasn't that far from, I just have to go over a crossing, like a zebra with the lady, zebra, what are they called? The um, lollipop, lollipop lady. Lollipop ladies. And then it would be, yeah. I would be home basically. And um, I remember waiting at the gate. We're well, not waiting at the gate, going to go home at the gate. 
and her brother had come along. And I remember being like, oh shit, it's really happening this time. And I had a Barbie pack lunchbox and it was, it was like a love heart shape with like a handle on the top. Yeah. It, it was, you know what they were like back in the day, they were hard plastic. <laughs> Weaponized. So he came towards me and I just remember getting my, my lunchbox <laughs> and smacking him around the head. And I just ran. Yeah. I just ran. And then when I got into school, they're like, oh, you're right in lines, you shouldn't hit people. <laughs> But then when I look again, when I look back, I'm like, why didn't you fucking ask why there was a big boy at the school gates trying to beat me up? Exactly. Number one, I'm a girl. And number two, I'm in primary. He's in secondary school. Completely unbalanced. You know? Yeah. Crazy. They, they had it coming. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. definitely. He did have it coming. But this escalated then. You got in a fight and you ended up with an ABH on your record at the age of 15. Yeah. What brought that about? So, um, so when I was about when I was 15, it was like MSN, instant messaging over the computer. And usually you end up adding, you just had random people on your thing. And I had, I didn't know this girl, but my friend had known this girl. And she was, uh, she was in arguments with her. And then she had came onto my MSN talking smack basically right and she was saying oh when i see you i'm gonna i'm gonna do this type of thing oh, keyboard warrior yeah exactly yeah. but um my mom was always my mom's made me adopt that attitude like somebody says they're gonna do something to you don't be walking around looking over your shoulder if you see them you go for them first type of thing <laughs> <laughs> so um we were at a, a nappy night which is like under 18s in a club okay and i had seen her and my friend was arguing with her how do you know what she looked like I kind of figured that it yeah. was the person because this particular friend didn't really get into arguments with people. Okay. So, um, so yes, yeah, so they were arguing and um, I approached her and I said, are you going to like apologize for what you said? Because remember when you, you said that when you see me, you're going to do me something. Yeah. And she was, I don't think I, no, I didn't even give her a chance to say anything. I just punched her <laughs> in the face a couple of times and her lip was like, her lip was swollen. Yeah. She had a, bloody nose yeah and um we were gonna get kicked out oh so um the bouncers came along and put us in a room and they're like basically you're going and they were going to get our coats but me being the mouth teenager i was i was running my mouth yeah they're like oh you're a bully and i was like i'm not a bully she's older than me and she said that she was going to do something to me so and was it I racially her, motivated as well from her no that side. one wasn't racially motivated. okay that wasn't was yeah that wasn't um so yeah because i was running my mouth they were like okay we'll call the police and i was like call the police i don't care yeah i don't care and then, what were you um, saying when you mean, when you said running your mouth? What were you saying? I can't remember. Yeah, I, I can't remember, but probably some some stupidness. Probably yeah, some yeah. stupidness. But um, but yeah, and then they took us to the police station. Um, they didn't cuff us though, which was nice of them. So, so they took both of you. <laughs> yeah, they took yeah. both of us. My friend got charged with ABH as well. What was her role? Just arguing. Just just for arguing. Yeah, just, just for arguing. Mouth. Yeah. Oh no, she had. Sorry, she had. Um, She'd hit the go of her flip flop. Okay. So that's that's <laughs> that's why. <laughs> so you go to the cop shop and did they put the try and put the frighteners on you? We're, we're not going to charge you, but we're going to put the frighteners on you a bit. Don't do the silly stuff, that kind of thing. No, they were just uh, first of all they were acting like they were trying to. How can I? How can, it's like they were fishing for information, <sighs> and I was just like, yeah, I did it. I did it. Yeah, yeah. This is the reason why I did it, yeah. and they were like, okay, because you admitted it. Um, you're going to be put on bail for two weeks. We'll drop you home because obviously we're underage. What does that mean on bail for two weeks? Um, so where the, you've got to go back to the police station. Oh. Yeah. So I was on bail for like two weeks. Gotcha. I remember uh, they said to me, are you going to be able to come back on the 7th of June, which is my birthday? And I was yeah. like, I'm not coming back on the 7th, just my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll do the 8th. So I was like, okay. And then um, they dropped me home. And uh, my mama answered the door. And they're like, hi, miss, blah, blah, blah. Um, this has happened with your daughter. And I just went upstairs and went in bed. Did your mom sweat you over that? Or was she like, yeah, stand up for yourself? Um, so I told her the story and she was mm. like, well, that's what I've told you to do. But I wasn't expecting police to be knocking on my door. But yeah. you've admitted it. that like, it is what it is type of thing. But what they said to me was... If you don't, once I had, uh, you know, like the record, the uh, mm. caution on my record or whatever, they had said, if you don't do anything until you after, until you turn 18, yeah. once you're 18, this would be wiped off. Right. So um, so from then, I, it was kind of like a, a reality check for me. Yeah. It was kind of a reality check. So that couldn't aggravate your later sentence, then it was squashed. Yeah. 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 But you did get into some other small crimes around the age as well, didn't you? Yeah. 
Yeah. What so, were they? so like, so after when I was about 14, 15, I had moved down to a place called Easton. Mm. And a lot of my siblings are from there. So I was involved with my si- So I've got two brothers who are five months younger than me. They're twins. And they were into certain, you know, just, I would say, uh, like petty crime, yeah. basically. So um, we had, uh, we used to do things like um, rob people's houses, mm-hmm. like the rich kid. Um, parties because our parents gone to broad abroad or something yeah um and then we'd also do things like we'd be in our community and if we could smell like weed in the atmosphere we'd be like that's a bud yard we're gonna go in there and take the weed and sell it on type of thing yeah so yeah but a lot of the time because i was a girl i mean i still kind of got a baby face now i just stand there with a backpack and you know look around to make sure nobody was coming yeah. and whatnot so so yeah so did they go in with weapons or anything like that? Or was it more innocent? Um, no, they never went in with weapons. I don't know how they knew, but it was like they always knew if the house was empty or not. Yeah. And if you grabbed some weed, how did you resell that? Well, the one that I did do, um, it was too early. So it hadn't grown properly uh... yet. So we weren't able to sell it on, but I ended up smoking it. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up smoking it. <laughs> How was this affecting your education? You mean in my younger years? Younger years, yeah. So, um, so yeah, no, I uh, finished school of GCSEs. Um, as I said, like I moved around a lot, but I've always been quite, I wouldn't say smart without trying, but I didn't revise for any of my GCSEs, but I still walked away with GCSEs. So I feel like had I had more interest from the teachers or a little bit more of a push, then I probably could have got A-levels. But um, they were never really interested in me. Was there any subjects you were particularly interested in? Yeah, sports. Sports. Yeah, so I did B-Tech sport. I was yeah. passionate about, um, you know, I used to do sprinting. I used to do gymnastics. So, so yeah, I was quite a, I was you, quite a tomboy, to be fair. Did you think you could make a career out of sports somehow? Yeah. So originally what I want, wanted to do when I left school, I wanted to join the RAF yeah. and become a fitness instructor. Yeah. And I, you know, like when you have to go through the barracks, as they say, to do all the training, I wanted to do that part. Right. Um, but then I started smoking weed and I wasn't in school anymore. So, you know, I was like free, if you want to call it that. So I was just running around doing whatever I wanted to do. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, no, I'd, my schooling wasn't affected by it later on. But in my younger years, I did, uh, I did struggle with things like reading. I had to have a specialist come in and help me read. It's like you got the poles from the two worlds, isn't it, going yeah. this direction? And yeah. Or down, yeah. So in terms of relationships then, you ended up with someone who was abusive? Yeah. What, how did that come about? So um, at the... So to cut a long story short. Oh no, don't uh, cut long story short on here. <laughs> we like long stories long. If you come on our podcast and give me 10 second answers. <laughs> 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 so um, when I was about 13, my aunt on my dad's side, um, she had met a man that she's married to. Yeah. And we were going to, they were dating for a couple of years. Yeah. And we were going to visit him in Peckham and stay over. So uh, I just remember driving through London and being like, oh, it's really, it looks really nice here. Like, I'd really like to live here. And I remember she said to me, she was like, Paris, if you want to move to London, when you get to a certain age, she's like, go for it. There's nothing that's stopping you. And I just had that stuck in my head. So um, on my dad's side, my dad has a different father to that auntie. And they, his siblings are in London. And I said to my dad, because I always had a relationship with my dad while he was in prison. Um, he said, get in contact with this uncle and if you want to move, he'll help you. So that's what I did. I moved to London when I was 17. Um, I lived there for a little while, but because um, West Indians are very strict and his mom's from St. Kitts. So going out in during dark, whether it's six o'clock, four o'clock, because it's, it's not allowed. Yeah. <laughs> and I came from a home where I had a curfew, but I was allowed out when it was dark, you know? So I was just like, fuck this. I don't, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be under <laughs> this lady's like management or whatever. So I moved back to Bristol for about three months. And then I got into some more fights and stuff. And I just thought, I just need mm. to, I just need to go. So I moved back to London and then I got in touch with Connections. 
and they helped me get a hostel. And then when I was in that hostel, I'd met the guy that was abusive. Do you want to explain who Connections are? Because we want to give them a plug. Um, I don't think they're open anymore. Oh, they're gone? Yeah. Okay. I don't think they're open anymore. Okay. Um, but they used to work with uh, 16 to 24-year-olds, I think it was. Yeah. That every avenue where you're struggling, they'll help you. So they made a referral and ended up with uh, a hostel, living in a hostel in Hayes, ha Hayes and Harlington called The Foyer. They're still open, though, I think. What was that like, living in a hostel for you? Um, it was quite lonely because... You know, growing up, my schooling was in Bristol. So, you know, around those ages, you're still friends with your school friends. Yeah. Unless you go to college. And I did go to college for a little while, but I got kicked out. Yeah. In Northwest London. Yeah. Because I was trying to sort out my housing association. Not host association. I was trying to sort out my housing situation. Mm -hmm. And I was absent for two days. And they were like, mm. you've got to go. So they made me leave. And then I was in the hostel. And yeah. that's where I met the guy. All right. Before we get to the guy then, to go from somewhere like Bristol to the capital yeah it's like me going from my little town up north to phoenix arizona yeah like the capital is like the hive energy isn't it the pace everything's yeah. different yeah yeah did that overwhelm you when you first went there or did you buzz off that energy i would say i buzzed off it because in bristol you don't really i mean i'm not sure about now but when i was growing up you don't really see you know black men in suits and you know driving nice cars and stuff like i mean with bristol it's still very much it's very segregated so is you it? have your black area and you have your white area yeah. and the black area is the gutter yeah unfortunately mm. but when you come to london you see it on so many different levels yes. you know so it was more inspiring for me like oh so if they can do that then i can do it type of thing yeah so so yeah so i buzzed off it <laughs> yeah very similar to my hometown um it was it's more multiracial now but growing up it wasn't at all but then you go somewhere like arizona and it's it's uh the melting pot they describe our, our, um the us as so you got um everything from like redneck hillbillies to yeah. gang bangers driving around in the low rider cars and, every, yeah. and everything in between so yeah i buzzed off that um, yeah. that that definitely um all right the abusive person story then what 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 how did you meet him and click up so he lived in a hostel too yeah and we ended up spending a lot of time together and we just ended up being in a relationship yeah and um yeah he was he was very violent to you yeah right away not right away to begin with oh, piece of shit we hate women beaters yeah to begin with it was um you know like words but because i've always been you know quick with my mouth yeah i used to run my mouth back yeah so um and he didn't like that so then his way of trying to get me to sharp was trying to put his hands on me but again mm. you know i've been fighting since i was <laughs> five six so yeah you know, and one thing my mom's always said to me, don't let no man put their hands on you. Yes. So we would physically fight. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, he used to get knives out and was stuff Was he a big well. guy or? No, he wasn't. He wasn't. I would say he was about five, five, eight. Yeah. Five, nine. Did he, that. did he harm you severely in any way physically? No, he never got the chance to. Okay. <laughs> he never got the chance to. He never got the chance to. Um, on one occasion, he did strangle me. He had like my arm up mm. and his arm like under there. Yeah. And I don't know how I did it. I just blacked out and I punched him in his face like from yes. behind. Yes. And then somehow I like kicked him in his uh, yep. groin. <laughs> and then I remember crying and be like, don't fucking put your hands on me yep. type of thing. So um, there was another time where he rugby tackled me into a lift and yeah. he used to get out knives and stuff and smash up my room, you know. But I literally got to a point where I was so... Not unbothered, but I was so used to it. When he used to yeah. smash up my stuff, I used to be like, is there anything else you want to break? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Make sure that's a close so I can see the fire in Paris's <laughs> eyes as she's telling the story. <laughs> How long did you put with this jerk for? Uh, about two years. Two he ended up years? Prison. No! Yeah. Oh. Had he not gone to prison, I probably would have still, not now, oh. but I probably would have, it probably would have been a lot longer. So you get caught up in this cycle of the abuse, sorry make up yeah, more abuse exactly. think it's not going to end again starts again mm -hmm. shit and you were just so young at that time as well yeah yeah so i could just see how you were trapped yeah 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 it was uh i mean you used to live like across the corridor so even if 
you know, not want, it was impossible. Yeah. But I wasn't aware of, um, you know, things like refuges and nobody ever had that conversation with me. And like, my, as I said, my mom always said to me, don't let no man put, put your hands on, put their hands on you. Yeah. But my mum never, my mum's never been in a relationship like that. So even my mum wouldn't know the type of services that you could mm -hmm. have to help you, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. Have you done karate or anything? No. Just all just street, oh, yeah. just street, <laughs> <laughs> just street fighting. <laughs> so as tough as you were during this two years, then did inside was it hurting you to be going round and round with this guy in circles? Yeah, I would say that. As I always say, the words are more damaging than the mm. physical part of it. Yeah. But I was always focused on the physical part of it because. Mm. You know, you can have an argument with your friend and they can say something nasty to yeah, you, you know? Yeah. So I didn't realize that that is potentially damaging yeah, as well. Yeah. Especially if you've been told it every day or once a week or at least once a month, you mm -hmm. know? So, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. In some ways, I felt trapped and I didn't really know what to do, to be fair. Mm. But you were rescued inadvertently by the police. What did he do to piss them off? Um. So, him and his friends are. Uh, were running around robbing cars with a fake gun. They actually went into somebody's house and stole their car. <sighs> yeah, very brazen. <laughs> very brazen. And what kind of sentence did he get for that? He got eight years, I think. Wow. Yeah, eight years. So that was a good riddance at the time. Yeah. Um, did your next relationship work out better? No. No. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. Um, so he never he never said anything uh damaging or he was never abusive but yeah. he was a prolific cheater was he yeah right yeah, he was a prolific cheater <laughs> so how long did that one last that lasted um how long did that last so what's funny is that i got with him after the perpetrator yeah and i was with him for a couple of years yeah he actually impregnated someone while he was with me mm. and then we split up and i got with a guy that ended up being in prison for and then after being in prison for that guy i ended up going back to that guy who cheated on me and brought somebody pregnant holy shit yeah at, now i look at it and i'm like that was a pretty stupid move to do but coming out of like prison and having all that abuse it was like naturally i gravitated more towards what i knew like i i kind of um you know how can i explain it i kind of made it so in my head where i'm like all right he might have cheated on me but he's never put his hands on me yeah all right he might have cheated on me but he's never called me out my name yeah you know he's never tried to control what i'm doing so and i always felt that i could trust him as well with like my personal stuff yeah if that makes sense did he end up in prison no so the one in worm of scrubs was the one who you were fighting with all the time no Okay, which one? <laughs> which one's in Wormwood Scrubs? So the one that was in Wormwood Scrubs is the one that I went to prison for. Yeah, the guy that um got the eight years that was juvenile. So okay. we were uh eighteen, nineteen. So why the time. was the one in Scrubs in Scrubs? Um, I think it was for drugs. For drugs. For drugs or firearms, one of the two. Yeah, and this is someone who. You just threw so many things at me in the last one yeah, you no, last I said. Know. I'm like, it's, it's gone from one person to like yeah. four or five. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the one is Scrubs. Let's go over this more slowly then. Yeah. How, how did you meet him again? So I had met him through, um, after I came out of the hostel yeah. um, in Hayes, I went and stayed with my uncle. Yeah. And then again, the same situation with my grandma. Mm. And then I went and got, <laughs> went and got another hostel. And this this hostel was in Wilsdon, mm. and I had a, a girl had befriended me in there, and she had another friend who was a male, who I met, and then we got introduced to the guy that I went to prison for. Ah. And from there, we used to go out and have drinks and food, and it was always a good vibe. So he was just a social friend. Yeah, to begin with, yeah. To begin I never with, liked him. To begin with, yeah. So what did it escalate into? It was kind of like. At that point, I kind of said to myself, like, it's not about looks. It's not about, it's more about, yeah. you know, how you feel around someone. Mm. And naturally, I just gravitated towards him because he always had a good vibe yeah. around about him, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, they say they always come with a smile. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he's very smiley, happy-go-lucky type yeah. of person. Yeah. And that's what I was attracted to. 
And then um, he had got recalled back to prison. So what was he um, being recalled for? Was he involved in drugs? He got recalled for driving without a license. Okay. Something stupid. Yeah. So um, at that point, I didn't really know what he went to prison for. I didn't really ask because mm. I feel like because my dad's been to prison for 21 years of my life, yeah. I'm quite, um, I'm not so focused on what you've done in the past. I'm more about the future yeah. because I do believe that you might not be able to change your way of thinking, but you can change the way, you know, you actually maneuver through society. And that is a really important life lesson for people watching this because a lot of people are at home right now. Um, because of the corona and they're depressed and they think about things from the past yeah and it just like releases these toxic brain chemicals yeah, yeah. but your attitude forward yeah is, is definitely the way I'm, I'm the same i'm just always forward yeah planning and trying to enjoy what i'm doing now mm -hmm. yeah so yeah it's, it's imperative it's that's very inspirational so you weren't aware then that this guy was involved in drugs at all no no. Yeah. No. Was there any warning signs of anything? Yeah, there was. Yeah. But I didn't ask. Yeah. Because I didn't want to know. Are you able Because it was like the moment you know, then you've got to start, you know, asking more questions. What were those warning signs? Just like having money and driving brand new cars and yeah. stuff like that. But I mean, he was nine, almost 10 years older than me. So I just took it as he's grown and he's got he's got what he's got because of his age, because he's, he's had, he's had more life experience, if that makes sense. Yeah. So naturally, you know, at a certain age, you would expect to have certain mm -hmm. things. So, so yeah, so that was some of the warning signs. Had you, before visiting this guy in Wormwood Scrubs prison, had you visited your dad in prison? Yeah. What was that like? What was the very first visit like? How old were you? I think I was probably about 10, 11. Okay. Because once my mom had got back with my stepdad, my dad was absent even before he went to prison. Because like I said, he was doing his thing. Yeah. Um, and then when he got to prison, that's when he got in contact. Mm -hmm. And my mom was like, no, why are you interested now type of thing? Yeah. But then when my mom and my stepdad broke up, I said to my mom, I want, I want to name my real dad. Mm -hmm. I remember the prison visit. Um, Which it was in Hawfield. What was that? Um, Bristol. Oh, it's in Bristol. Yeah, okay. Hawfield. So I visited him in Hawfield, and I remember, um, I remember feeling quite um, sad, um, like when they opened the gate, and he'd cut, and he came in, and I was happy to see him. You know, he was asking questions about my school and stuff like that. And then when the visit ended, I remember him going back and having the gate closed, and I just remember feeling I want to go with him. You know. I just felt like, why does he have to be here? But I didn't really understand what it is that he did. Mm. No, I don't know how I even got told that he had murdered someone. I just always remember knowing. Yeah, you so know? it's the separation anxiety. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you were so young, like, were you not intimidated by the procedures of going in? Um, no, there was one, um, one prison, Long Larton. It's category A. And they've got like big German shepherds walking around. They got like, I remember, I swear the dog's eyes were red. Um, <laughs> I remember feeling, oh, this is, uh, this is quite, um, looking back now, the security is high, like the gates are high, like there's barbed wire everywhere. Super that nice. was intimidating. But Hawfield, it's a, what, what type of prison did they call it? It's like a, it's like a court prison. So, you know, until you've been sentenced, it's one of those prisons where people go to court and come back. It's, it's like a remand it's, Yeah, prison. it's like a remand yeah. prison, like a holding type of yeah. prison. How old were you when you went to the Supermax one? I can't remember. Yeah. He was there for a long time, though. He was there for a long time. I think we did about three visits at Long Martin. Really? Yeah. Were there ever any situations during those visits where guards had to intervene or there were like lockdowns or any, any crises? No. It all ran smoothly. Yeah. 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 Were you, were you able to like bring things to the visit or were there like vending machines with snacks and things like that? Yeah. That was one of the things that my dad always wanted. <laughs> he always had to make sure he brought in a load of change for the vending machines. Yeah. Because my dad was, I think for him, I think he got to the stage where, you know, he's doing 21 years. So he's just like, I'll just eat whatever I want to eat type of thing. 
Mm-hmm. He ends, he's got diabetes now. Oh. But he's like, I want a chocolate bar, I want a fizzy drink, I want this, I want that. And we'd be going back and forth to the vending machine. I was so excited when my parents came to see me in Arizona and um, they got the bags of quarters. Yeah. And they, they had like um, burritos and stuff in the vending machine. I was like, yeah. oh. I was like, oh. I, was, I would eat like five, six, seven of them at a time. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Couldn't get enough. Um, so visiting him then, it seems your memories are all pleasant yeah 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 how many times did you visit him over the years do you think like dozens i wouldn't say dozens because um now i come from a poor background mm. my mom's always done like you know uh cleaning jobs and working behind the bar you know yeah. those type of jobs where you've got nothing left at the end of the month yeah so and she didn't like i said she didn't drive mm. so we would rely on like my dad's best friend or one of my aunties to bring me there yeah um so there wasn't loads of visits no okay because uh, it, it gets expensive for the prisons far away and stuff doesn't it exactly yeah all right so you are down with the prison routine and now all of a sudden years later your mate is in wormwood scrubs asking you to visit him yeah because you're familiar with all of the procedures and everything did you not think twice and there was no intimidation factor or anything? No, I weren't intimidated. Just at went all. straight in there. Yeah. How I still you know, when I walk in, I walk back and they're like, put your arms down. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How different was it visiting your friend versus visiting your dad? Um, because he was in Wormwood Scrubs and I lived in Wilsdon, because it was a holding jail again, it mm. wasn't uh it was quick and easy. I got there within half an hour. Yeah. Cab there. 15 minutes if you call it call it 15 minutes yeah um we'd have to visit for i think it was an hour and a half two hours and i'd go home and i'd visit him again as soon as i could and in between that he has a mo- he had a mobile phone so i always felt it didn't really feel like he was in prison you know yeah how many months were you visiting him for before you were busted with the contraband um uh I can't remember. I can't remember. Um, I do remember once I started working full time again, I wasn't seeing him as often. What was your job back then? I was working for the NHS. So you got a good job. Yeah. Visiting this guy in prison. Did he scale you up on like bringing something little and then it got more serious? So uh, to begin with, he got recalled to prison and... um, within i'd say about within a month or so um no i don't think it was even a month because at this point i still had in my head it was a 28 day recall and he had said to me oh uh can you go to the caribbean shop and get me some uh stew fish and i have a friend that works in a prison who's going to bring it in for me i was like yeah sure it's fish you know even my fingerprints on the what can they say oh you can't bring a fish in here you know so um so yeah, it was fish and like, you know, CDs, um, within a Jamaican culture, when there's dancers going along, they would, uh, they always record it. So, and then those, those, uh, DVDs would get passed around yeah. and then you sit at home and you'll watch the dance. Yeah. So, um, it was things like that CDs and then people would hand CD- CDs out after the rave or whatever. And, um, yeah, so I gave him like CDs, USBs, um, which had music on again. So I was like, if that gets caught, what can they say? You know? So how how are you bringing these into the prison undetected? So it was the teacher, the education teacher. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. So where did you pass them off to the teacher at? Um, multiple locations, to be fair. Yeah. Um, some, I actually don't remember the first one with like all the fish and stuff in. I don't remember where that was. But I remember being in the cab and going there and giving it to him. And they'd yeah. be like, okay, bye. And then, you know, going about my business. So are you giving it to him without going through any security procedures, pat downs and body scanners and things like that? Yeah. So it would be outside of prison. Oh, so you're, it, not even, on a personal... you're not even bringing it in. No, I'm not bringing it in. No. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm not bringing it in. So you're just transporting it to the teacher or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And then the teacher is, is uh, doing the thing with it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... How did this escalate then? Um, I don't, again, I don't remember the very first package of drugs, but I do remember him being like, my friend's going to give you, say, 10 pounds worth of weed. 
own possession type of thing. And because I was giving it to the teacher, again, I didn't feel like it was an issue because I wasn't physically bringing it in. Because had he asked me to physically bring it in, I would have told him to fuck off. Yeah. You know? So yeah. um, that's why, um, sort of my last podcast, that's why I say I feel like I was kind of like groomed into the situation mm. because had he just said, here's all these drugs, you're going to give, I would have said, oh, hell no. I don't think so. Yeah. But it was bit by bit by bit. Mm -hmm. So the first one, again, it was for own possession. So I was like, who am I to deny him that? Like, I know he has a weed habit. I yeah. met him. I knew he smoked weed. So, were you getting paid? No. Were you aware of conspiracy laws at this point? No. Yeah, imagine you wasn't. I wasn't aware of conspiracy <laughs> laws when, when, until the SWAT team came. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did it start to turn bad? Um, most of the time it was weed. Yeah. So it got from own possession to now selling it in prison. And then at first I wasn't receiving any money or anything in my account. Yeah. And then another favor comes along. Oh, can you have this put in your account? Okay, sure. I've got an extra account. Amy, you can put it in there. Check for 50 pound, 10 pence or 50 pound, five pence. You know, they leave one P or two P just to say that's the person who's, the person who said they're going to pay you has paid, if that makes sense. Yeah. Let's just go over this. All right. So, so I often get asked, how do people settle drug debts in prison? Yeah. In Arizona, it's called street to street. So if I have got some uh, drugs off you, then my girlfriend yeah. on the streets does something with your person on the streets. Yeah. But you're saying banks were actually Bank used transfers. in this. So yeah. you didn't have to meet anyone. It was just no. all of them. No. Can you just go over slowly then? So, so um, who does what again? Just go over it slowly. So um, you mean from start to finish? Yeah. How, how the money's transferred. Okay, so I don't know about the transaction inside. Yeah. But say somebody wanted, um, this is the thing with prison. Depending on how desperate you are, there's no price limit on what you're selling. Yes. So um, so say somebody wanted 10 pounds worth of weed, they'd end up spending 50 pound. Yeah. And to make sure that person has actually settled that debt, that person will say to their relative, put in 50 pounds, one pence. And then my ex would contact me and be like, can you check your account and see if there's 50 pound one pence? I confirm. And then he'd be like, okay, he's paid. Here you go, type of thing. So the one pence meant it was him. Yeah. That specific person. Yeah, that specific person. Yeah. Gotcha. So it was like the pence was like the receipt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I see. So now your bank account is in the mix with your name on it. Yeah. Okay. I see where this is going. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so... How did they detect what you were doing, the authorities? So I have a friend, the friend that I met him through, I'm still friends with him now. I don't talk to him that often, but he said at the time they were finding like slips of my bank details mm. in people's when they're spinning people's cells. Mm. And apparently my ex was bragging and stuff. So eventually they would have caught on anyway. Yeah. But the main reason how my main slip up was that, as a, again, I was working full time. And my ex had contacted me and said, I want you to do it today. And I'm like, I've got work tomorrow. I'm tired. It was after midnight. My bedtime's probably about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Yeah. And then when I'm doing what I'm doing, he's saying, so when you wrap drugs to detect, to, um, you know, get rid of the smell, yep. um, you wrap them with clean film and then you smear a load of Marmite over that clean film. And then you wrap it again and then do it. I, I did it so many times because I wanted to be assured that it didn't smell. But on this occasion, he was nagging at me and he said, oh, can you stop putting so much Marmite because my weed is getting sticky? So I said to him, but you know that I can't smell because growing up, I was a snot nose kid. I couldn't breathe from my nose. So I had to have operations. Whoa. So um, You can't smell? I can smell okay now. Okay. But um, due to having... I think my animals were too big for me. Right. So I had loads of snot coming out. So I had to have operations. So you've had it, some difficulties though. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I said to him, I can't smell properly. So there's nobody here to make sure that it doesn't smell. So I'm doing it this way to make sure. No, 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 listen to me. I've been doing this for how long? I said, okay, we'll do it your way. We'll do it your way. Um, did it his way. At this point, it's going through the postal service ah. because he had convinced me to move to Watford. Okay. So I'm no longer in London now, so I can't meet up with the teacher to give him the stuff. Yeah. So it's going straight to his personal mail at in the prison in Wormwood Scrubs. And then it's getting mailed 
to the prison. Getting mailed to the prison. Yes. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Who would have thought of it? <laughs> so, what's the procedures for incoming things like that at the prison? Aren't they seen detecting it quite quickly? So, what you have to remember is that with the law, nobody can open your mouth. Right. So, regardless if that's at work or if that's at home. Yeah. I mean, even your wife isn't allowed to open your mouth, as far as I know. Well, they can scan it and stuff. Yeah. So, they, they never put it through the scan. So, your mouth can't, they can't open your mouth. So the, the only thing they could do is either scan it or sniff a dog. I don't think they had the scanning facilities there. That's why they used the sniff a dog. Right. But on this occasion, the sniff a dog had indicated that there was something in the parcel. Uh. So they had called the teacher down and said, you need to open it. He opened it and he just, like a stack of cards, he just collapsed and just said, you know what, this, this is what's been going on. And just told them from the offset. So they threatened him and he just spilled the beans on everybody. Yeah. Including you. No, he didn't spill the beans on me. He he said, yeah, I'm accepting it for somebody, but I can't tell you who it is because he's a dangerous guy <laughs> and I can get in trouble type yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, but um, in the parcel, because, again, I was, I was, uh, I was, I was sleepy. Mm. You know, I was tired. So, um, the way the parcel was, I had to, like, it was a book because, of course, it's going to the education department. Yeah. So I had got a load of bags from underneath the sink because the drugs were moving around inside. I stuffed the box so it'd feel, you know, solid. Mm. And in one of those carrier bags was my name and my address oh! from a home delivery. <laughs> so that's how they knew it was me. How did they approach you? It was it was fucked up. It was really fucked up the way they approached me. Yeah. So um I lived across the road from where I worked. I like literally across the road, 100 minutes uh -oh. down the road. I know where this is going. Yeah. So I was at work. They came in saying, You're what? Uh, we want to speak to Paris, such and such. Um, they got my manager to show them where I was. They came towards me and they were like, Are you Paris? Blah, blah, blah. I said, Yes. They're like, we're, under, we're arresting you under the suspicion of blah, blah, blah. And these are all not in plain clothes or anything. They're all. They're in, no, yeah. they're in plain clothes. Oh, they were in plain clothes. Yeah. And there was four of them uh, for little me. <laughs> uh, and then um, they came and searched my house. Uh, they found like, you know, pieces of the puzzle, so like the same clean film that I used and another one of the boxes that, you know, were identical to the one that I had already sent to the prison. Things like that. Were you in custody while they were searching your house? No, I was okay. there. You were there? Yeah. yeah. I just let them search the house. Were you watching and like, think, fuck? <laughs> well... To be fair, when they said we want to search your house, I was like, yeah, go ahead. Because I knew there wasn't any drugs there. But then when they started to pull out the clean from stuff, I was like, oh, oh, that's what they're looking for. <laughs> that's what they're looking for. And I've got a dog, so my dog gets really excited when we have visitors. Oh. And she was like running around with the evidence bags. And they're like, can you tell your dog? And I'm like, I can't control her. <laughs> she works for me. <laughs> Destroy the paraphernalia. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so when did they take you in? Um, they took me in that same day okay. after they got what they wanted from my house. Uh, from there, they took me to Collindale Police Station. Um, the funny part is, is that they actually offered me a job there years before. <laughs> but because of my dad, they withdrew the job. Uh... So, so yeah, I just remember being there and thinking, how do you guys have given me this job? It wasn't as a police officer. Yeah. It was answering emergency calls. Yeah. But had you given me this job, I probably wouldn't have turned out the way that I have. I might have been a little bit more mindful, you know? Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so they questioned me. And even on the way to, you know, from Watford to um, Collindale. Mm. Oh, yeah, we know who your dad is. Oh, yeah, we know about your cousins. Oh, yeah, we know about your siblings. Mm. Oh, you've done really well considering your background. Mm. And I just remember thinking, what the fuck is that supposed to mean? So I've done really well because I work in fucking admin. Just because my dad did something, what that means I'm, I'm going to be a drug user or I'm going to go and murder someone, you know? It made, it, it made me angry. They shouldn't be allowed to say things like that. No, they shouldn't. And I do feel like when they looked at my record and seen who I was related to, they were like, oh, yeah, let's, let's, go, let's go in deep with this one, you know? So has so he got a reputation as a bad man in the system then? In prison, no. Okay. My dad, um, my dad has done really well. He what he speaks like four different languages. Wow. He's uh he's like studied psychology and you know he's he's done really well. I would give him that. Yeah. So when they were saying this to me, oh yeah, we know about your dad. I was just thinking to myself, 
at this point, my dad's probably on maybe 18, 17, 16, maybe somewhere between that. He's on that year anyway. Wow. And I remember thinking to myself, like, my dad could have strung himself up in a cell mm. if he really wanted to. Mm. At least my dad's taken his, you know, his sentence. Like, I'm not saying that makes it any better for the victim that was involved, mm. but my dad could have just got out of it the easy way by killing himself, but he didn't. He was paying his price and he was making the most of the situation. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. When did you learn what your charges were? Um, they charged me. Did it? No, they released me on bail. And then I had to go back. And then it was all conspiracy, 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 yeah, conspiracy. I got that one. All right, let's just stop the story here for a second because we want to get an important message out to people who are being manipulated into this situation. Yeah. Now, from my knowledge, guys would like, prisoners would put like pen pal ads up. Women start write to them. Then they get them visiting. Then they get them bringing stuff in. Yeah. And they blow smoke up these women's asses, just selling them everything under the sun. Like, I love you and all this. Yeah. Going to get married when I get out. Yeah. Just to get the drugs in. Mm -hmm. What would you like to say to women who may be in this position now, maybe feeling pressured or anything like that? I would just say, um, for me, I didn't look at the potential of me getting in trouble and how that would impact my future. So number one, I would say, if the person really cares about you, they're not gonna ask you. They're not gonna ask you to do that type of stuff for them. Um, second to that, if you're being pressured, there are people that you can speak to. Um, because I, I believe that there's not a lot of, um, like with domestic, with domestic abuse, there's not a lot of emphasis put on the, uh, the mental side of it, you know? Um, he might tell you you're special and he loves you and X, Y, Z, but he doesn't, he loves what he, he loves the money that he's making. That's what he loves. So he'll tell you whatever the fuck he can just to get you to do what he wants you to do. And second to that, as what I was about to say is that there are people that you can talk to, um, you know, uh, places like Solace Women's Aid, although they're not, you know, n knowledgeable about um, drugs in the prison system, they will be able to identify where you're being taken advantage of. So, yeah. And it's not just the love of the money. There are people in prison so addicted to drugs. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw people on the phones to the family members who've got huge drug debts, making up all kinds of stories to get these drug debts paid just so they could keep going so they could get high again, get the drug debt paid off and, and, and get high. Yeah. And also I saw fellas screaming at their girlfriends and partners mm -hmm. to bring drugs in Yeah. because they just needed their fix. And this is so selfish because all those calls are recorded. Yeah. If they're being listened to, they're just sacrificing their partner right there so they can get high. And conspiracy to bring drugs in prison is a serious charge. Mm -hmm. You could get years. So these guys just want to get high and they're going to sacrifice that woman's life for years. She's in the exact same shitty place that he's in. It, it, it is completely selfish. So one of our messages today, we're just hoping to raise awareness for the women out there so you don't end up in a fucked up situation like Paris, which we're about to get into now. What what, what happens next? Do you have anything to add to that before? Um, I mean, in terms of like domestic abuse. Just to the women out there, yeah. Yeah. Um, as I said, like, just try and think about your future because once you go to prison, you've got a record. And no matter how long you're good, you're always going to be remembered for it in terms of you have to do a CRB check. You have to do CRB checks to work at fucking JD nowadays. So it's always going to be there. So if you can deal with that, if, you, if, if you're if you okay with that and you want to do everything you can for your partner, then that's the repercussions that's going to happen. But as I said, if you're okay with that, then go ahead. If you don't care about that, but for me, I do care about that. So only do the crime you know you can do the time for. Exactly. Yeah. All right. You're going in now. Have you brought any things with you? So the remand or they're just bringing you into the remand? Um, so I, um, once I had, uh, you know, had a conversation with my barrister and she said it's definitely going to be custodial because I had lost my job because obviously they came and arrested me at work from February to 
um, till June, July, um, I knew I was going to prison. So I said that the earliest opportunity, just remind me, because I'm not doing anything. If I get a job now, I can't commit to it anyway. So what's the point? I must well just do my time as early as I possibly can and just get over and done with. So I went to court that day and um, I asked them to remind me. They reminded me. I went with, um, you know, comfortable things, you know, like this, like a tracksuit, tracksuit, some pajamas and just the bits and bobs that I could. Um, but then when I got there, because I was going to court, I had like, a, you know, a business dress on and a blazer and stuff. And, you know, I looked professional. And um, when I got in there, they're like, oh, you can't wear those heels. And that's when it dawned on me that I was like, oh, shit, you can't. You, 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 they could tell you what you can and can't wear here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Did they give you some deck shoes? Yeah, they tried They tried to give me like uh, these prison uh, trainers. I was like, I ain't fucking wearing those. I've got trainers in my suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, so yeah, the I remember going in through the gate. Um, Which prison is this? I'll remand. Is Holloway. This? Holloway. I've, I've spoke there. Yeah. A couple of Holloway. times to oh, the females, okay. yeah. Yeah. Before it's shut. Okay, yeah. So yeah. I was at Holloway. They booked me in, did whatever, you know, they do, you know, P test, drug tests, and blah, blah, blah. Went on the um, the induction wing. I was there for one night. It's like where they assess to see, you know, if you're a bit suicidal or if you're a bit. I was fine. Because I had mentally prepared myself for it. There wasn't anything. How can I explain it? It's like I expected the ultimate worst. So when I got there, it wasn't as bad as what I thought it was going to be. Because, you know, you hear stories about, you know, women forcing you to do things with them sexually and stuff like that. But it wasn't like that. So I had a lot of female co-defendants in Arizona. So I learned everything that was going on on that side as well. Yeah. Guards um, getting women pregnant. And yeah. Some women, because they're so malnourished, would have um, just miscarriages. And yeah. One situation, the guards came in. A woman was on the toilet, had a miscarriage. She passed out on the floor. They revived her with smelling salts and ordered her to fish the dead baby out of the toilet. Yeah, it's disgusting. Yeah, it's All right, so, so, you're, so you're going in. Are you aware of what length of time you're facing? Because you, you said you, you no. psychologically, you, you're bracing for the worst. Yeah. The worst is... The amount of possible time you could be doing in my head facing a life sentence. Yeah. Conditions, yeah, bad. But the prospect of losing the rest of my life was what messed with me the most on remand. I was on my run yeah. for 26 months. Okay, yeah, that's a long time. Um, so when did you learn what your prospective sentencing range would be? Uh, before I was remanded. So they okay. said I'm looking at two to four years. So you knew going in. Yeah, And you'd I have knew. to serve 50% of that in the UK. Yeah. So you you found that, were you thinking, right, that's a long time, or I can do that in a heartbeat, walk in the park? What was... I felt like, because I mean, there's stuff that I'm not going to disclose for personal reasons, but I've been through so much in my life that I felt yeah. that prison is not going to be one of the things that breaks me, you know? There's been so much more things before that that's broken me, but I've had to, you know, dust myself off and continue. So for me, of course, I wanted the lower end of the sentencing guidelines but i remember weighing up in my head and saying as long as i'm not so so old that i can't have children i'll just do the sentence i've done the crime i feel guilty because i did feel guilty because you know as i said before like it got to the point where there was class age i was going into the prison now there's some people in there you're waving it in their face and that should be the place where they can get clean and had my dad been a drug you know drug user and he's done all this time and then somebody's like, oh here's some heroin I'll be fucking angry. So I felt guilty. I wanted to do the time and just get it over and done with. I can't believe it. The 90% approximately the guys I were housed with were injecting heroin. Yeah. And I thought, you know, why is society arresting people that are mostly got drug problems or doing drug crimes yeah. and putting them somewhere they're injecting drugs? Yeah. Even young people come in or busted for weed. Yeah. End up yeah. shooting up and heroin that, yeah exactly it's, it's ridiculous and the taxpayers are paying for it all yeah that's why i always say i believe in more of a an holistic approach in terms of managing offender behavior because like for me had they had sat me down and said you're being exploited this is the reason why i would have been like okay i've never looked at it like that before you're, you 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 might be right and then you know i could have ended up a different way but is that just so quick to throw the book at people but at least 
through your story, you've probably just woken up a lot of people who are being exploited yeah. by coming in here and saying and, yeah. and telling what you're telling. Yeah. All right. So you're in Holloway. You're on remand in Holloway. How are you fitting into the prison population? Um, there were a lot of people like me in there. There were a lot of people. People who um, smuggled drugs in. People that have just. One thing I've noticed is that a lot of the time when women go to prison is because of a man. Yes. So there were a lot of women in there because of that. Separate to that, there were a lot of women in there for petty things like shoplifting because they're an addict and they've got to find some way to, you know, pay for their addiction. Um, so, yeah, there were a lot of people, a lot of people in there were from poor backgrounds. There was only, I'd say, a handful of people in there that were, you know, of higher class. So I, I fit in pretty well. I spoke to the general population and I spoke to the foreign population and some of them were like telling me what they were in there for and stuff. And there was a lot of like Romanian pickpockets and stuff like that. Was, yeah. it, was it similar when you were there? Yeah, there was a lot of uh, Romanian women in there. Yeah. A lot of Romanian. But they're, they're lovely. They're lovely people. Mm. They are really lovely people. They always used to do all the servery and stuff. And if you're like, oh, can you give me an extra egg? <laughs> I'll give you an extra egg, you know? But yeah, they were always, they're always sweet women. But yeah. then you do get some racist people like, oh, fucking Romanians. And, you know, and I was just like, you're in the same place here. We're all the same right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Well, in Arizona State, it is all racially segregated. So if you're white, the neo-Nazi Aryan Brotherhood prison gang, they tell you the rules and they decide who lives or dies. And then you've got the black gang, the Mau Mau. You've got the Mexican gang. You've got the Mexican-American gang, the Chicanos. And, you know, everyone's sat at separate tables eating. Okay. And if you, I, I started working out with some Mexican Americans. Yeah. And then the whites, the woods come up to me, they're like, look around this room. Do you see any other white guys working out with the other races? That's These guys have got swazis on them and everything. I'm like, oh shit. That's crazy. <laughs> so, as a mixed race person, how did you fit in? Is there any like pressures from any people or any racism coming at you in the system from guards or prisoners? No. No, there wasn't any racism there. They're all very accepting in London yeah. prisons. I mean, because I've, I've always, although I've got a white mother, I've always considered myself as black because outside of, outside of, how can I explain it? To everybody else, unless you're within the black community, you don't realize that I'm mixed race. You know, um, some people may be able to tell, but generally I've got, I've got wide nose. I've got kinky hair, or I don't have kinky hair right now, but I'm more black than I am white, um, you know, genetically. So I say I'm black. I face the same issues as what, you know, black women do. Might, might not be as such as a high scale. However, I do feel it within this society too. So that's why I own, I say I'm black. Um, second to that, um, you do get... You were talking about racism in prison, right? So yeah, because some, some, some of our subject. some of our we've got a prison questions playlist on our channel. People sending questions all the time. Yeah, and some of our most watched videos are what is it like to be mixed race in prison? Okay. But that they're from the American perspective, right? So we've got a big American audience. Yeah, they're probably fascinated by what is it what is it like for a, a mixed race person yeah. in a London prison? We've never answered yeah. that before, and and female on top of it, <laughs> that will really fascinate people. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, no, I mean, the experience isn't any different. I mean, I had one of my cellmates, uh, I call her my bird time bestie. Uh, her name is Shiv. She was full black. Shiv as in Shank? No, Shiv as in Siobhan. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Shiv as in Siobhan. So, um, so yeah, she was, uh, she was like my best friend. I thought that was her. a cool prison name and you <laughs> spoiled it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, she was full black because I was in a dorm. Yeah. And then there was me one white mum, one black dad, and then the other two women, they were both white. One of them was Scottish, and the other one was, uh, you know, English. Were you housed in a dorm right away? No. Okay. I was in a two-person cell, which I hated. Did you? Yeah. More than the dorm? I loved the dorm. Really? Yeah, I loved it. Oh! I absolutely loved it. Wow. Because um, in the two-person cell, you have to remember these, these rooms, they were originally designed for one person. Yeah, it's like so, living in a toilet with someone, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And with the dorm, the toilet was completely, like there was an actual, you know, uh, 
a concrete part where there was an actual door. So you have privacy, you could get changed in there. Yeah. And then also the dorms used to house five women, but now they house four because they say there's too many people in one room. Yeah. So like I could do a cartwheel across the dorm if I wanted to. <laughs> so for me, it was more about having space, you yeah. know? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I loved the dorm. I absolutely loved it. Yeah. I loathed it, if anything. <laughs> All right, let's describe then your first day and just like, because it's weird, isn't it, going in? Yeah, yeah. What was your first day like? Um, My first day like, um, so I was reminded, it was like, it was dark by the time I got into my cell, so I just went straight to sleep. So you've been in prison transportation, have you? Yeah. Yeah, in the van. In the sweatbox. Sweatbox. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah. coughed up. Yeah, exactly. With some other pissed off people who've been just been sentenced. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, um, see, I remember my first night, I just remember getting given my stuff you know like the prison slippers and stuff like that what is it that they give you in the uk prison for women then um we got like a towel um mattress little anti-shank toothbrush little finger toothpaste uh i remember i think i can't recall 100 percent, but i think they give you like you know like the prison um allocated clothes to you yeah downstairs in the reception are they a particular color blue and gray blue and gray okay. yeah blue and gray so you'd, yeah. you know, you got the gray prison track suit yeah um and then you'd get like you know just a tank top type of t-shirt that's uh blue mm -hmm. um and i remember the slippers were like red good quality slippers though i'll give them that <laughs> <laughs> good quality slippers but you were also allowed to bring in some of your own stuff yeah. as well yeah wow because they'll check it Okay. They'll check it. So. So what got through of what you were bringing in? Everything apart from what I actually got into prison wearing. Yeah. No, he no heels. Had, yeah. The no heels. heels. Were stopped. Yeah. 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 Um, they could be weaponized as well. Yeah. I because of the business stress, they were like, "Yeah, you can't wear that in here." Because I think it was too professional. I could have maybe yeah slipped through if I wanted to escape, which would have been pointless. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, they were like, "Yeah, you can't wear that in here." But everything else went through fine. And what I found interesting on the delinquent podcast. You said they didn't strip search you. No. They didn't. Everyone gets strip searched where I was at constantly. I, some days I'd be strip searched three times a day. No, they yeah. I think if they had done it, I think I would have I would have definitely struggled. Yeah. I wouldn't have allowed it. Yeah. So that that was the main thing that I was scared of being um, you know, booked into to prison. Yeah. So I was thinking if they strip search me, I'm gonna end up down the seg straight away because I'm not gonna allow it. So you would have kicked off if you'd have been in yeah. if it happened in an American prison. Yeah, definitely. Swung at them. Yeah. 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 All right, so you've got through with your stuff. They're now taking you. Did they take you right away to your cell with, with your first cellmate? No, they give you like, they say, are you hungry? You say, yeah, no, I said, yeah. They give you like a little microwave meal. It's what, like fish. Fish. Fish, chips, and peas, I think it was. Do you, Did they ask you like if you are vegetarian or if you're a certain religion or anything like that? No, not until you actually get up onto your wing. Ah. Then that's when they ask you. But um, I think... Every every day in the morning, you got to tick what you want for lunch anyway. Yeah. So they would always have, you know, like a. They would have to accommodate, you know, Muslims and you know, vegan. Well, not so much vegans now is a little bit more important, but back then they didn't. So they don't just bring trays of slop. Yeah. And say eat this. You have a bit of a choice. Yeah. Of what's they would coming. have to know how many needs to come to that wing, basically. So that's why you tick what uh, it is that you want. Yeah. So even if you wanted a, you know, a um, halal version of the food, you could get it. Yeah. You didn't have to prove that you were Muslim or anything like that. Is that whatever they got, they got it. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, before the lockdown, then I was speaking in schools, you know, scaring the living daylights out of kids with what happened to me in the hope they wouldn't get involved in the bullshit. Yeah. But they think like it's all PlayStations and gourmet food. No, it's not. Was it gourmet food? No. That was what I struggled. That, I would say, if I had got sentenced to two or four years, mentally, I could have done it. But physically, the food, I probably would have starved to death. Really? Because I was, and it's not because they don't feed you. Yeah. It's because I was not eating the food. Right. Was that stress? I would say it was more me trying to control my situation. And like, like I said, I'm from a Jamaican background. So I eat things like hard food, which is like boiled dumpling and planting and, you know, stuff like that. So when I'm getting boiled potatoes with mud still on the top of them. Oh, uh, yeah, I had that like, too. I'm not, yeah, I'm, yeah, like, I'm not yeah. eating that. <laughs> like clusters of filth and, yeah. and like... Um, Look like lesions and shit. Yeah, yeah. And human hers. Yeah, I had a hair in my food before yeah, as well. And yeah. a fingernail. 
Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I, I recognize what you're saying because I, I had to steal myself to not eat. Yeah. And it was weird because I realized I've been eating like three or four meals a day. You yeah. don't, you don't need it. Mm. Yeah, no. It's I'll go to the toilet a lot. Now I'm not even going to the toilet anymore because <laughs> I'm just steal to not eat. And you kind of like you go through this. I think about food, think about food, think about food, and then there's the pain barrier, and then I detach from it. And yeah. even to this day, I've never gone back to eating as much as I ate mm. before I got arrested. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say eat more now. Way more. <laughs> eat more now. Yeah. <laughs> I, w- I went in there weighing about nine and a half stone. Yeah. I've still got my discharge slip now. Mm. And I actually found it the other day. New Year came in. I was like, I need to get rid of stuff. Yeah. Came across the discharge discharge uh, slip and I weighed six and a half stone mm, when I came out of prison. Good grief. That's how much I was not eating. How tall are you? Five free. Wow. Yeah. It's tiny, isn't it? Yeah. Um, did you have a favorite food over the course of the whole thing of your of your entire incarceration? No. What about what you could buy from the inmate store? Um, just junk. Just junk. Yeah, just That's junk. That's it, it's all high priced junk. Yeah. That they're giving the prisoners because it's they can maximize the profits off exactly. it. Exactly. And they give these contracts out to their buddies, the prison people, and it's oh, it's just one big scam, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. All they had, they had all that junk. But they, they did have where I was at, like peanut butter and nuts and stuff. Yeah. And I was like, that would be a meal for me, would be eating some nuts and some peanut butter. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. we, got, we got sandwiches for breakfast and then slop was the other meal of the day. Yeah. How many times a day did they bring food? So you get a lunch pack, uh, uh, sorry, a breakfast pack, which is like an apple carton of you know that horrible milk that it's all for like kids, 10 years it's all kids size yeah, school kids size, size things that doesn't yeah. fill you yeah. yeah um it's kind of like the cereal pack that you get is kind of like you know like you get those multi packs like when you go to the supermarket yeah so it'd be like a small one like that yeah and it's not branded it doesn't have any sugar or anything it's plain as plain can be yeah. so you'll get that with like uh and you can also get some uh toast but the butter is so cheap no matter how much you Get that toast hot, that butter is not melting. <laughs> oh. So you'd have that in the morning and then come lunchtime, you get a sandwich yeah. and like an apple. Mm-hmm. And then come the afternoon, that's when you'd actually get your hot hot meal. Although it used to come up lukewarm. Yeah, same here. They spend hours getting it to you, don't they? Yeah. You just get used to eating cold food. Yeah. All right. So presently in the chronology, we're in the holding cells and that right now before you, you, you get, you're doing your, um, you've got your stuff through and you've not got to your cell yet. That's where we're at. Yeah. So anything else happening in that period before your cell? Um, yeah, there's, so they call it reception over. There's women crying. Mm. Um, some women are cursing because, you know, you just get those ones that go in and out, in and out, in and out. Oh, I can't believe I'm fucking back here type of thing. The shock of the newly incarcerated. Yeah. 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 Some women, they're really, really crying. I was just like, why are you crying? <laughs> <laughs> um, Is anyone like, shut up? No, they weren't. People they were supportive. Women are quite supportive, actually, yeah. when it comes to certain things. You know, naturally, you know, women were supposed to have this mother and mm. instinct, and I do mm. feel that prison does bring it out in a lot of women. Yeah, because in the men's, the way they settle disputes is through their fists. Yeah. Oh, no, women do too. Yeah. But there's a lot of this, though, back there's and forth before they start fighting. Yeah. 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 All right, so you're on your way to your cell. What's it like arriving at this cell? Um. I remember going in and being like, I just, I don't know. I just remember being like, no, I'll sleep on the top bunk. Like, yeah, it's fine. Because I was keen to know, like, because they were like, oh, because they explained you're going to go here first Mm -hmm. and then you'll get moved to your actual, your wing. So obviously I knew that everybody in this area where I was now, they're either newly here themselves like me or they've been through the system already. Yeah. So I wasn't worried about that bit. But then I was thinking, so when am I going to end up from here? I was thinking, am I going to be fighting? Is there going to be, you know, a force, force for forceful, like lesbians and stuff like that? Because that's what I heard. That's what I heard a lot. Um, so yeah, I just felt like, okay, like get me- mentally motivated as in, you know, expect the worst. If it's better, then it's better. <laughs> And what was the first conversation with you, Sally? She, um, she said, oh, my name's such and such. You know, she just introduced herself. But one thing that was really weird is that when I got there, she was like, oh, I'm going to introduce you to everyone. And she was like taking me out of the ring and saying, oh, this is Paris. And I was just like, I don't, I don't see the, it kind of felt like school. 
Yeah. That's how it felt. <laughs> That's how it felt. She was actually doing you a favor because when I was in places where I didn't know anyone and I felt danger and all of a sudden I see someone I know yeah. and that person then takes me around, introduces me to everyone, all, yeah. all the different heads of the racial gangs. Yeah. And then the safety's there for you all of a yeah. sudden. Yeah. They're all looking at you like they want to eat you mm. to like you've been accepted. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. For me, I was more like... That attitude that I went in with, I was like, I don't want to talk to nobody. Yeah. And if anybody, you know, tries to f fight me, like, I'll beat them up. Type You're of like thing. a lone wolf warrior type. Yeah, aren't you? I'm like, yeah. how can I? Like, obviously, I didn't want to have fights with people. Yeah. I'm not the type of person to antagonize someone and start a fight. Mm -hmm. But if you come at me, mm -hmm. I'm not a pussy. I will fight you. you know but I will do. avoid it as much as I can, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, some people, like back in the day when I was younger, somebody was like, what are you looking at? Mm. I'll just go straight in for a fight. Yeah. But at this age now, somebody's like, what are you looking at? I'm like, oh, never mind. You know, <laughs> I, I know what I can do in my head. That's enough. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that gives so, you yeah. confidence. And... Yeah, exactly. All right. First day with your new cellmate, um, you're getting to know her. How does it feel to live in a room the size of a toilet with a person like that, a complete stranger? I remember my first time, like, she, used to, she used to fart a lot. <laughs> and I was just like she's like oh sorry and laugh and stuff and you know you ain't actually got a window yeah so this one i was like yeah she's a, she's a she's quite open you know yeah um yeah. but then when you're in prison your toilet's right there there's not even i'm gonna smell her poo at some point so but there's an etiquette isn't there yeah like there is. sit down flush 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 get all the smell yeah. that way yeah that kind of a thing or yeah, people no, like people like, like spray things or fl <laughs> get, like try and get rid of the smell burn toilet paper yeah, <laughs> yeah no, she wasn't like that <laughs> do you she think she was like... institutionalized uh i would say halfway there because yeah. i think she had done maybe about three sentences okay and that was her longest sentence she had to do 17 months right yeah yeah but um what was she in for do you know she had a fight with a man mm. and she'd beat him up mm. but he had attacked her yeah but because she already had a record they believed him oh, over her. But she could have been lying. She couldn't, because that's what you get a lot of people like, oh, no, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. But you yeah. know, damn right, you did do it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. So, I remember like, I was craving to have a shower and I had to go in the shower and I was a bit worried because I've seen things like Shawshank Redemption, you know, where in the Boggs Diamond comes up to him, I could be a friend and you know, all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was it like using those facilities? Um, some women can be very dirty, mm. as in, um, you know, you can go into a shower and use tampon on the floor. No. Yeah, like stuff like that. And don't get people. Don't people get beat down for doing that? No, like disrespectful. Because to the rest. they do it in secret. Um. You don't know who's doing it, and generally, women. I've never known anybody to have a fight with something like that. It's more like yeah. of a shame thing. Like there's a bin right there. Mm. The same action that you're using to take it, you know, to take it off and throw it on the floor. You can do the same action of throwing it in the bin, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it's like you're purposely being dirty. Yeah. So, so yeah. So you would never know who it was. Because that's disrespecting everybody, yeah. isn't it? I know in some countries um, where water pressure is low, they actually poo in the shower. Oh, wow. So there were some situations of poo in the shower. Um, the people responsible did get beat down for doing that, yeah, and, and adjusted in their methods. Yeah. Um, so you give off this, there's the fire in your eyes, I can see it now, you give off this confidence, you've been through this stuff, you, you're tough, you can handle yourself. Yeah. Are people just naturally respecting that and warming to you? Or it's different in the men's side, because like, if you're tough in the men's side, people want to make their name off challenging you. Yeah. If I could take down the biggest guy, I am the biggest guy. Yeah, yeah. How uh, did anyone come at you like that? In prison, you mean? Yeah. No, I was always humble. Mm. As I said, like I went in there with the attitude, like if somebody tries to put a house on me, I'll beat them up. Yeah. But um, but I was humble. I didn't go in like oh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I want to mm. be top bread or you know, it yeah. was it was nothing like that. It was just like I just want to do my time and get the fuck out of here. Yeah. I'm not trying to get a name. Mm -hmm. I just want to. I want to be comfortable because yeah. as much as as much as people want to go on like they're bad and they don't fear anything, mm -hmm. if you're if you're human 
and you have a problem with someone, yeah. you are going to be looking over your shoulder while you're in prison. Because that's the thing about prison. You can't leave. Mm -hmm. Out in the reality, in the real world, you can lock your own front door and you have control of who's coming where. And, but in prison, you don't have that. So would I want to start something with somebody for no reason? No, I wouldn't. Exactly. And if you're in a building with 200 other people and you know you've got to live with those people day in, day out. Exactly. You've got to get along with those people somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's that was my mentality and that's yours. Yeah. But there are people in there that have very little things and they see someone like you come in, confident, well-spoken. There may be attributes about you that they're jealous about and they're thinking, right, I'm going to cause some drama in this person's life. Yeah. You get a lot of games. Yeah. And you said there's a lot of this. Yeah, yeah. Surely they tried to suck you into something at some point. I did have one argument with, um, so my main summits that I did most of my sentence with, I ended up doing the longest. So naturally, new people would come into the cell. And there was a particular girl that had challenged me. Um, when you say challenge you, can you say what, what? So she had taken some of my tobacco while I was sleeping. And at this point, I'm weighing six and a half stone and she's big. I'm not going to start a fight with somebody <laughs> that I know I'm going to lose, you know, and then end up down in the seg with no TV, no nothing. So um, I had a conversation with my friend about it and I was like, yeah, I kind of caught her trying to steal some of my tobacco. I was like, but I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to move out of the cell because being an argument with somebody in your cell has got to be the worst thing. And it wasn't because I was scared. It was just because uh, it was coming to the near, of, near the end of my sentence and I was entitled to tag at that point. So I don't, it was a bit of, it was a bit of burn. I don't care type of thing. But my friend took it as her problem. <gasps> so she had said something to her. And then I was like, oh, why did you do that? Now I'm going to have to, you know, have an argument with the girl. And then we're in, we're in the cell. And she's like, oh yeah, because she ain't got, you know, we're arguing. She's like, oh yeah, she hasn't got big enough balls to say it to my, say it to me, and blah 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 blah. And she was like, I'm gonna hit her in a minute. And I remember I, I was like, come and come and fucking hit me, come come and hit me, and you'll see what happens. And then she sat down. And I said, yeah, that's what I thought. Because you're talking, but you're not doing anything. And with talkers, I don't really, because I'm the type of person. If I say I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna hit you, I'm gonna hit you. I'm not even gonna say it. I'm just gonna approach the situation, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, I kind of gathered that, and then she started to get other people to try and get involved and stuff like that. But then I was just like, you know what? You're coming to the end of your sentence. I don't want extra days. I don't want extra this. I don't want extra that. Because, you know, I'm little. I'm six and a half stone. I'm going to have to use a weapon. And if I hurt somebody, I'm going to end up with more time. And my goal is to be out of those gates. So I just read more. And I just kept myself to myself more. And I still had friends. But um, I, I reserved myself a little bit more. So you navigated this really well. Yeah. 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 Um, how easy is it to transfer a cell in the London prison for women? It's easy. Is I it? could yeah, I could have moved. But I was like, I'm not going nowhere. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I'm not going nowhere. <laughs> like I know we had an argument, but I yeah. made it a point as in, all right, we might still be in the same cell, but I don't need to I don't need to have a conversation with you. You know? And how long did that last for? It lasted for about two months. Was it tense to so, like or the detention die down? Detention never died down. Really? <laughs> it never died down. But I didn't care. Yeah. I didn't care. Yeah. Because I was like, you're not a friend. I wouldn't have you as a friend on the outside. I don't really care what you think of me. And I'm sure you don't really care what I think about you. But um, the thing that made me switch a little bit was um, she had said something about my mum. Because mm. I had a picture of my mum on my board. Now, even in, the, in prison and on the outside world, my culture, Jamaican, you can't tell somebody about their mum, <laughs> you know? So she had said, she had said a comment about my mum. And I said, she said my mum was fat. And I was like, but you're 25 and you're fat too. I was like, my mum's had two kids. She's in her 40s. You're 25, you know? You look like shit. My mum's supposed to look like that. So, you know? <laughs> so, so yeah. So, um, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't care about the tension. And how did it end then? Who got moved where? Um... I got released. Oh, you got released. That was your last Sally. Oh, no, 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 no. Actually, I ended up moving with another girl that I was friends with on the wing. Yeah. Because um, it got to the stage where it wasn't the tension that was annoying. It was like, um, I kind of felt like in prison, you have your, you, you, you get, you get a lot of, you make fun out of situations, you know? Yes, dark humor. So, um, and that wasn't going on in the cell anymore. And that's the days that keep you going, you yeah. know? 
so I was like, yeah, I need to move. I need a better like environment as in more laughs. So I can do detention, but I'd rather have some more laughs at the same time. Yeah. If it was equal, then I would have stayed there. I did the same thing. It was hard for people to move cells, but um, the Italian mafia took over and like they were out, the head guy was outside smoking with the guards at night while we were all locked down. Oh, wow. And he could move anyone anywhere. That's crazy. So, so I got one of my co-conspirators, uh, co-defendants, Joey Crack moved in and this guy just told the stories and jokes constantly <laughs> like the prisoners were lined up to listen to the stories we we couldn't get them all in because yeah. there only so many and he just the humor yeah just takes you out of it doesn't it yeah. out of the stress yeah yeah and you find what i found funny as well was that when i was in prison the stuff that i found so fucking hilarious on the outside, I'd be like, that's in the chalk, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but because you have not much to do, you've got to find fun somewhere. And everything's magnified, isn't yeah, it? Exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right, so we've jumped towards the end of it. Let's go back. You're still on remand. You've, you've, you've gone in, you're with your cellmate, and do you have to go to court regularly now for your case? Yeah. So soon as I knew that I was going to prison, I wanted to be guilty. Okay. So, so that eliminated was, a lot of court bullshit. Yeah. For yeah. me, it did. However, my ex at the time, who's my co defendant, and he decided to plead not guilty because he came uh, up with the scenario as to what he was doing. And I don't want to get into that too tough because it's, it's quite. Of course, wrong. yeah. Um, so it ended up being like a Newton hearing. A what? A Newton hearing. What does that mean? Basically, what it means is that when, say, there's like a group of four people, mm. one of them decides to plead not guilty and the rest plead guilty, yeah. then it will go to like a Newton hearing, which is like a trial. Uh, However, there isn't a jury. It's just the judge. Gotcha. He figures, he deliberates, basically. Yes. And the judge said, you're lying. Don't believe it. I'm taking it as a, as a not guilty plea. Yeah. Um. So because of that, we kept having to go to court because they were having to bring people in who were witnesses. Uh, I mean, back in the van and all that yeah, shit. Back yeah, back in the van, back and forth, back and forth. Um. So, um, so yeah, so I think I went to court maybe about five or six times. Mm. I hated it. Yeah. I remember there was one point, I actually thought of this the other day. I remember I was in the court cells and, you know, things were going on uh, with the court situation. And I remember with the guard and I was like, I just want to go home. But in my head, I'm thinking prison is home. Mm. And I had to double, you know, double check. Was, that was home to me at that point. And I was like, I want to go home. And it doesn't, it sounds, it doesn't sound that, um, important but mm. it was kind of like i had to catch myself i had to be like that's not your home that's yeah. your temporary that's prison that's not your home you know yeah i had the same thing i go to court yeah and i think i just want to get back to myself yeah exactly yeah exactly you're starting to get a little bit institutionalized yeah exactly what about this other thing then where you're like you're in the transportation van and you can see the free world through the window i loved it did you yeah i absolutely loved it um but I realized, because I always say that I have, you know, I have the ability to step out of my shoes and go into other people's shoes. Yeah. And um, while I was in the van, like, you know, you've got, they've got the screen so mm. that people can't see who you are. And I remember being sat in there and looking, because that was the, the only outside, you know, you get. And people can't see me. And I remember thinking, like, I'm literally like a ghost. <laughs> and then I remember, <laughs> I remember as well being sat in the box and being like, I don't actually have a seatbelt. So if anything, if there was an accident, it just goes to show how ig insignificant my life is as a prisoner. Do you, do you get what I'm yeah, trying to say? Yeah, you're just like a number, right? You are. Yeah. yeah. Like, and, then, and then I started to think like, this is fucked up. Mm -hmm. It's a fucked up... Uh, not only fucked up situation to be in, but just the way that they treat you as in like, you mean nothing, you know, just because you committed a crime. And for me, like I said, I believe in holistic, you know, holistic ways of managing people. But like for, you know, people that have committed things like murder and rape and stuff like that, I get it. But in situations like that, I'm just like, there could have been another route to, could have been another route to this. Well, one of the things we're calling for on this channel is an end to the war on drugs. Because the vast majority of people who are in prison for drug offences are non-violent, yeah. and they're not—they're not dealers. Yeah. Usually, they're just users or they're doing small stuff. Yeah. But they are, like you said, you're insignificant. They are fodder for this private prison system where human mm -hmm. beings are warehouses, commodities. Yeah. 
prisons are getting 50, 60 grand a year yes. to house you. Yeah. It's absolutely sickening. This is why it's like with my last podcast, I said, they wouldn't send us to prison if they didn't make money from us. Yeah. They wouldn't. I mean, I remember being on the canteen sheet and getting my stuff. And in a pound shop, you get these free sponges that yeah. are like a massage sponge. Yeah. In prison, it's a pound for one. So I know you're going to the pound shop and you're getting these free for a pound and mm -hmm. then you send them for a pound each. How much are you making off just those sponges alone? Oh, yeah, they're importing them from China for nothing. This is this is what I mean. Yeah. They wouldn't... It's, it's another form of slavery. It is. It's another form of slavery. There are more people of colour in the American prison system now yeah. than were held under slavery before slavery was abolished. Yeah. And it's also a fact as well that you had more of a chance of growing up in a black family with a two-parent household while you were in slavery rather than now in modern society. Wow. They call it the new Jim Crow. Yeah. Yeah, there's a book about that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really good, exposing the system. If people, yeah. if people want to check that side of it out, the activist side of it out, look at that for that book. Is it called the new Jim Crow, the book? I've yeah, seen the it. new yeah. Jim Crow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, all right, we were talking about then when you're looking through the van and you're seeing... The outside world. For me, it was like a tease though. I was like, ooh, but then I'm like, oh. The only, <laughs> the only thing I would say tease me was when I would go past like things like KFC and I'd be like, oh, just, <laughs> I would do anything just for a bit of chicken or chips or, you know, just hot <laughs> food either way. And you think all the places you used to hang out and eat and do stuff yeah. and you go past those roads and you're like, oh shit. And yeah. all those memories come flooding back. Yeah. You're like, true. why am I in here? Yeah. Fucking hell, what have I done? It's funny you say that because I remember um, you have like, you know, you, you have your normal screws that work on certain wings and they turn over. You pretty much know all of them. Yeah. And I remember there was this one particular screw that didn't work on our landing and we had a hatch open and they had KFC delivered. <sighs> And our hatch was open oh. and we could smell. I was angry. I was like, no, you can't you can't be doing that, man. We're in there hungry eating potatoes every day. And you've got fucking chicken. We can smell it. And she was yeah. like, shut up. She just put the hatch up. <laughs> would any of the guards then, like, not like, well, the thing that you were doing, were any of the staff doing that, like smuggling things in for the prisoners? No. Um, some of the people, because two of my cellmates were pregnant. Mm. so um they did used to give us stuff that they weren't allowed to but it wasn't anything that was illegal because yeah. they were pregnant women they were like, here's a couple of biscuits or yeah here's oh we've got there was one point where we all decorated the there was like always a competition on christmas mm. where everybody would do christmas decorations and whoever got the best would get a buffet yeah and um wow we were like you know we're coloring for <laughs> days and days like you know making christmas decorations yeah and because the screws could see we we're really going in and we ran out of color like you know uh pencils and coloring pens and whatnot mm -hmm. they had um one of them i brought some in she was like don't tell nobody that i brought you these but here's yeah, some extra yeah coloring because there are some good staff members out there. Yeah, People definitely. attack the cops, attack the guards. Yeah. Well, there's good and bad everywhere. Yeah, it's true. It's very true. With the guards then, females and males, are you getting treated differently? Are some of the men guards hitting on the women? No. I would say on my landing, I could see that the, the men were a little bit more not reserved, but... They had to be mindful about how they speak and how their presence is received by that person. Yeah. Because you get some women in there where they don't care what the man looks like. They just, they want to have sex, you know? So yeah. they have to be mindful about how they interact with that person. Yeah. Because even if somebody said, oh, uh, they, seem, they seem a bit friendly. Oh yeah, she told me that she had slept with him. That they're, they're more than likely going to be an investigation. Yeah. So they had to be mindful. The women, screws, they were... um. Some of them were like quite mothering. Yeah. Yeah, they were quite mothering. They say that when they brought the female guards into the male system, yeah, there was less violence. Yeah, probably. How does that work the other way around with men guards being around women prisoners? I would say uh, there was a particular uh, prison guard. His name was uh, Mr. Atelier, and um, he was a Caribbean man. He was just, you could just tell he had a good heart. Mm. It was very like straight to the point, like, no, you need to be in your cell at this time. You need to be behind your door. But he was very, uh, I kind of seen like a dad in him. Mm. But he did always used to say, you're the same age as my daughter. Mm. You shouldn't be in her, you know? Um, but, sorry, I missed. Okay, so I was asking you about the reverse of yeah. the women coming into the men's prison 
the men are calmed down around the women is less violent. Yeah. How does that work the other way around when men guards around female prisoners? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'd say that some women probably see them as like, you know, father figures. Is, is it a, does it calm them or? I wouldn't say it calms them anymore. Okay. I wouldn't say it calms them anymore. I would say it was probably the same. Yeah. If anything, you probably get some women that are jealous over some relationships that the, you know, the prison officers have with other women. Yeah. So in America, you're a ward of the state. All sexual acts are illegal. Yeah. And if a staff member has sex with a female prisoner uh, or, or the other way around, I think it's classified as sexual assault even. Oh, really? Even if it's consensual. Yeah. Because it's like if you're having, um, like they have laws to protect people having sex with minors. Yeah. It's almost the same as that situation. Yeah. I agree with it. Is that how it is in, in London prisons? I wouldn't say, no, I don't think it's the same. I think it's just, I think it's, uh, what's the usual one? They always uh, sack people on, uh, is it mis misconduct? Misconduct. Yeah, it will probably be on misconduct. Yeah. But I don't think, I've never actually looked into that. I don't think there's anything on a, a case of protecting vulnerable people because people are vulnerable in prison. Yeah, yeah. So, there are vulnerable people in there and some of the women i imagine may be around a female a male guard and think right i'd like to have sex with that person are the guards getting hit on a lot no 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 okay. i never seen it yeah i never seen it yeah. i did see one thing where there was a younger girl who had fancied one of the he wasn't uh he wasn't an officer as in he locked you up and unlocked you yeah he he did different bits in different areas. Like he did like, he worked with the girls mm -hmm. and um, one of them really fancied him. But he was like, do you get is that you? No, oh, oh no, you ain't costing me my job type of thing. Yes. So, um, but yeah, a lot of women fancied him. Right. Yeah, a lot of women fancied him. So in America, again, um, they had this thing called a finger wave where they searched your body, all orifices with a rubber glove on. Yeah. And you got men searching men's orifices, which led to sexual assaults on men, men on men assaulting each other. Yeah. Uh, it got ruled un unconstitutional in the end, and it, 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 it was before my time. Um, when it comes to searching the women then, you said that you wasn't strip searched, but I'm sure you probably were of other women who were strip searched. Um, what is the protocol then? Is it, does it have to be a female officer yeah. searching the woman? Yeah, um, how, always a female. How extensive is the search? I've I've never actually asked anyone that's been strip searched what it was like. Yeah. Um, but I do know that a male officer can even when you're going off the landing to go into education, they'll do this thing where they'll count every ten people, the tenth person will get searched. Yeah. And it has to be a woman. It can't be a man. Yeah. So um so yeah, so definitely strip search a man would not be there. That's good then. Yeah. Um did you see the prisoners because you earlier you said certain staff member had a good heart yeah and if new new staff members are called fish and new prisoners are called fish yeah fresh fish and the, the even the fish guards that have got good hearts because it's such a dangerous intense crazy environment six months later into the job their faces have turned to stone because mm. People are trying to exploit them. Yeah, yeah. So people, with, people with good hearts like that. Staff members. Did did anyone? Did you see anyone trying to exploit that? No, no, no. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. But to be fair, even if I had seen it, I wouldn't have put myself in the mix. If that makes sense. Yeah. I wouldn't have asked questions. I wouldn't have because I don't want to be called in and something goes wrong that I'm labeled a snitch because that's one thing I'm not. Yeah, yeah. So anything mm -hmm. that wasn't my business, I didn't con concern myself with it. And that's the best way to get through it, isn't yeah. it? The prison survival tips yeah. here, folks. Yeah. All right. The females who were my co-defendants said on the female side, there was a lot of things going on. And one of the things was you got a lipstick lesbian as the mum, you got a butch lesbian as the dad, and you got the young prisoners females are the kids and people structured they structured like that some people in the female side yeah uh, do you know what was going on in the lesbian or the bisexual community or how it was structured for the women i don't know how it was structured but i do know that a lot of people had long-term relationships and 
quite a few of the fights that I had seen was because the female that takes that male role within the relationship has strayed with another woman. Right. And then they end up fighting. <laughs> yeah. But in terms of like there being a mom and a dad, that, that, that I don't think that's a thing in England. I've never heard of it anyway. Yeah. I've never seen it. Did anyone approach you to be with them? Um, when I went on to induction, um, I always say like, there's fresh meat. When you first go in, there's fresh meat. The studs like fresh meat. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say every single stud because I don't want to tie, you know, tie, I don't want to come across. Just like explain I'm... what a stud is. So it's a, a female that looks like a male. Okay. Um, you know, they, how can I explain it? I want to make sure that I get the right terms because I don't want to offend anyone. Yeah, I'm the same. I'm, um, I'm having to revise my terminology all yeah. the time. <laughs> so, um, you know, like they, they'll just, they take on the male role. They'll, they'll act like a, they'll act like a man. Yeah. As in like, you know, their appearance is like a man. The way that, you know, that they, they might even go to the gym and pump weights and be muscly. Yeah. So um, they look like males, basically. That's what a stud is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying then about the studs? Oh yeah. So um, so when I went on to uh, I can't remember what the part of the prison is called now, but there's a part where you go and do an induction. They tell you all the rules and mm -hmm. what you can do if this happens and la di da da. Yeah. And I remember I was walking through, and I was fresh meat. So yeah. you can kind of tell when somebody's just come in because mm. they've had the sun on their face. You know, they're well fed. They don't look so stressed. <laughs> so I walked through and this stud kind of like give me the eye and i was like oh hell no oh shit oh no oh no i'm taking my hair extensions out i'm not i'm not doing anything that makes me look remotely attractive whatsoever <laughs> and it's not because i'm it's not because i'm homophobic yeah it's because i've only ever had a a female you know uh show interest in me once which was outside of prison yeah i've never been approached like that so i wouldn't know how to deal with it mm -hmm. without offending because what people tend to forget is that same-sex relationships the power is the same mm. so you know if a man if you reject a man you know there's there are some men out there that would be like oh i want to slap her in her face type of thing mm. but generally it doesn't happen but if you reject a woman she could potentially slap you in your face and it could just be a fight it's not gonna be a case of no you shouldn't uh shouldn't hit women they are a woman you know, yeah. <laughs> so that's why I was, um, you know, quite uh, mindful about if that was to happen, how I would reject that person. Yeah. But I had a boyfriend, so. Yeah. I mean, last place I went dancing at was um, two brewers in Clapham, gay bar. Yeah. And guys came up to me and I just thought it was a compliment. You know, I'm not going to yeah. take it the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So listening to your podcast on um, Delinquent then. You did raise the banana thing. I don't want to be. Yeah. Cr I don't want to be. Cr I don't want to be too crude here. <laughs> uh, but I'll let I'll let you just put this in your own words. Um, what what that's about? Um. So yeah, some some women use bananas as a well. When I was in prison, um, women would use bananas for like for you know to release their sexual tension. If you want to call it yeah. that. Um. You know they use it as like a dildo. Mm -hmm. Um. But only. I only came across one person that did that. And you said that to keep the, they tried to keep them right for a reason. Yeah. So the, this particular woman would be like, I want a straight one. I want a straight one. And me being naive, I was like, why does she want a straight banana so much? And then it was actually one of the officers. I was like, oh, you don't, you don't know what she wants it for. And I was like, no. And then she was like, well, let's just put it this way. She said there was a woman every saturday she would be very happy when the bananas came and then <laughs> i started to you know i'm like okay now i see what she's talking about yeah but yeah they would want it to be ripe so that you know it's not mushy of course i just want to give a disclaimer out because we've had other people come on and they've talked about you know the sex aspect of prison and this and that and people say sure why is sean talking about this stuff we talk about every single aspect of prison on this channel and sex is a big aspect of it. And we're not shying away from that subject because snowflake people out there think that, you know, any, if you talk about sex, it's wrong. You can't just put that out there. We're just completely open and we want everyone to understand what it's like. And I had a woman visiting me while I was in prison. I took pictures of her down to the shower quite a lot and did my thing and that's generally what people do out there and it, it's actually called going on a date 
you got your plastic bag from your sandwiches, you got your, your girlfriend's picture, and you got a little bit of tape, and you put it on the shower wall, and that, that is going on a date. So if people can't handle people talking about the sex stuff, I don't know what to say, because it is... It's a human, it's, it's a natural <gasps> human part it is. of being human, you know? And you go without it for longer and longer, yeah. and there's a whole cycle of yeah. a- adaptation to that yeah, that you have exactly. to go through. You have to remember, some people get... um. If some people don't release that tension, they can get very angry. Yes. They can get very angry. It yeah. can make some people, you know, angry, so. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then moving on. Um, so you went to your hearing, that funny hearing that's got a funny title, and you got sentenced. The Newton hearing, yeah. How did it feel to get sentenced? I was relieved. Um, out of every professional I came across, it was the judge that ultimately said, you're being taken advantage of. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I was looking two to four years. So, mm. but the judge, I had wrote a letter because when I had first got remanded, my barrister had asked that judge, which was a different judge to the one that actually sentenced me. Yeah. They asked for a pre-sentence report, which is, you know, they do like a psych- psychologist, mm-hmm. uh, you know, um, not therapy, but they do, you know, like a diagnosis of you would be able to cope in prison. Yeah. And the judge said, no, no pre-sentence report for those two, as in me and my partner at the mm-hmm. time, but a pre-sentence report for the for the teacher. He allowed it for the teacher. And um, my barrister said, the best thing you could do is write a letter. So I wrote a letter. I spilled my whole guts in the letter. I said, from start to finish, what I've been through, X, Y, Z. So this judge that had read the letter on the sentencing day, he had said, um, the first thing he said was, uh, you know, you were doing, you were doing, you were just starting in your life and you've come across this situation. I believe you're being taken advantage of. However, I feel, I admire the fact that you reminded yourself into prison because not not a lot of people would do that. He was like, I'm glad that you did that. And he was like, I'm fair to that. He was like, your letter to me was very, uh, what's the, t- what, what word can I use to describe it? Um, like opening, it was very like, um, you know, I just I just got down to the knit. Honest. Yeah. 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 My letter was very honest. And he said it was actually better than a pre-sentence report. Wow. So I said, oh, okay. Well done. Yeah. yeah. And then um, he said 18 months. And when I got the 18 months, like, I felt kind of dizzy because I was <laughs> like, 18 months? That means I'm only doing nine months in prison. And then at that point, because I had already, I had reminded myself in the August and I got sentenced near the end of November. At that point, I was like, I could get tagged wow. within like four weeks. Wow. So I was like, wow, like this, this is mad. And I actually said thank you to the judge. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thank you, thank you. And he like nodded to say, yeah, like, okay, type of thing. Wow. And then when I went down to the courtroom, the, the, the um, you know, the basement where the cells are to speak to my barrister, she was like, well, I can tell you I wasn't expecting that. Mm. She was like, I was expecting you to get a lot longer. She's like, I do want to say, though, that the prosecution may appeal your sentence because he's gone outside of the guidelines. <gasps> so yeah. that was hanging over you the whole time, was it? No, she said, she said, but because I've done most of my sentence already, she was like, they're not going to do that. So she said, because by the time it goes through uh, court, mm. she was like, you may already be on the verge of coming out. And she was mm. like, they're not going to let you out and then drag you back in type of thing. So she was like, but I just want to let you know that it could be a situation. So... I remember thinking, well, if they do that, then they do that. But I'm focusing on the tag. <laughs> yeah. Were you satisfied with your barrister? Yeah, 100%. She, um, I can't remember her name, which is really sad, but she she helped me out a lot because why are we in the dock? My ex was in my ear saying, please not guilty, please not guilty. Mm. Please. When all the court proceedings are going with the new and hearing, saying, oh, change your plea to not guilty, change your plea to not guilty. But because I was so used to him telling me something in my ear constantly, just to get him to shut up, I was mm. going to do it. Mm. And I called over my barrister and I said, I want to change my, and she was like, no. And she turned around, Good. she was not listening. Good. And I, f- I can't explain how much I thank her for doing that for yeah. me. Because she, you know, legally, I could have not not got her into trouble, but legally, like she was going against what I wanted. Yeah. But again, she could see what was going on before I could. Mm. So she did me that favor. Excellent. Yeah. How did you find your barrister? Yeah, she was um she's pretty she was pretty straight to the point. She was like, the evidence is against you. 
think pleading guilty is the best thing for you to do. No, I mean, how did how did you, you get assigned with her? How did? Oh, um, so I had got my ex to set me up with a solicitor that he had always used. Yeah. And then he had arranged this barrister. Okay. So um, I can't even remember what the what the. Uh... So he he paid for a private barrister. No, 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 legal aid. Legal aid. It was legal aid. Yeah. Okay. And when you, so in America, jail is remand exclusively, and then prison is where you go when you're sentenced. Department of Corrections. Mm -hmm. Do you get rehoused then from the day you're sentenced, like you do over there, or is it you stay in the same cell? Oh, you mean like being sentenced in prison yeah once you get get sentenced in america you immediately get rehoused from the remand jail yeah to the prison system okay the big house yeah department of corrections did you get moved to serve the rest of your sentence no you stay in the same cell yeah oh, okay stay in the same cell because what a lot of people don't know is that in the uk i think there's probably about 11 12 female prisons in the whole of the uk yeah so almost every single prison is cut a all the way down to cat D. Ah. So, so yes. Yeah, so if you want, the only time they'll move you is if you're causing trouble in that particular prison. They just want to ship you out to, you know, get you away from the people that they feel are probably influence you and you're influencing or, yeah. or whatever. Um, so unless you actually ask to move, they won't really move you. Okay. Let me just explain that then. So what you're saying is that th there's so many, there's only so many female prisons so in that area, prisons of all security levels are housed together from minimum to supermax. Yeah. So probably about for maybe there's two that's purely DCAT, as in you go out, integrate with the community, and then come back in. I think there's probably about two that are mainly that. So were there any notorious lifers in Holloway at that time? Yeah. Who were they? There was one particular female. Her name was Lorraine Thorpe. What's she done? She was Britain's youngest double murderer. Whoa. Yeah. Do you know who she killed? She killed her father and a woman. But she um again, she was with it, she was fifteen and mm. the guy that she was with was in his forties. Was she being abused then? I think so, yeah. She just exploded. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Not by her dad. Mm. It was it was some kind of mix up, some argument. Mm. The woman that they killed had hurt the, the partner's dog, so they beat her up, but they went too far. They did some they did do some wicked stuff to her. Yeah. But for me I feel like I'm not gonna excuse her behaviour, but come on, you've got to give the girl some kind of lenience considering she was with a man that was in his forties and yeah. she's fifteen. Yeah. You know? That's it might that's rape completely manipulation yeah yeah exactly yeah if you're sleeping with a girl that's underage that makes you a pedophile correct well, me if i'm wrong you know will she ever get out she might even be out already oh, okay because she was a young she was a yoi so uh, a young offender yeah. so she might even be out but she struggled in prison did you talk to her the funny part is is that i never knew that she was in a prison until a documentary about her came on while we were in prison oh wow and um, she was, you know, we're crying, oh, I'm going to be on TV tonight. Like, <laughs> and um, when somebody had actually pointed out who she was, I was like, yeah, she looks like the devil. Like, she, she looks mad. She looks crazy. But then I actually ended up being not close with her, but we were, she was my friend. Yeah. She was cool. Sweet, sweet when she was ready to be. Did she open up to you then? No, she never opened up. But I could see that she was struggling. You know, yeah. things like self-harm and stuff like mm. that. I mean, her dad's not here because of her and the man. Mm. And the man actually committed suicide. Did he? Yeah. Holy shit. I think he committed suicide. I think it was like two weeks before they aired the documentary. Wow. So he got out the easy way. So now she's got all this burden on her shoulders. That's so heavy. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Any other um, lifers or notorious inmates, high profile? There was another one where it was, it was these two women... They had killed one of the woman's ch child, a little girl. It was some part, I think oh, it was Jesus. Essex. Yeah. Somewhere around that. I cannot remember their names at all. Let's keep them out of it. What was what was the motivation? <clears throat> Apparently it was um again domestic abuse. Yeah. The, the the um the one who didn't give birth to the child was jealous about the child or something like that. They said you know what newspapers are like, they yeah. they lie. But either way, the child died yeah. under their care. And they said it was through abuse. So I just watched something on Netflix about um, when a parent is so angry at the other parent, they kill the children. Yeah. Yeah, there's a that word happens. for it, but I can't remember what it is. 
that happens. Yeah. Um, oh, it's not called femicide. It's called something else. I can't remember what it's called now. But I know, I know what you're yeah, talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Was Rose West in there? No. No. No, Rose West wasn't in there. Yeah. She was. Uh, I think she was down somewhere in Surrey or something like that. Really? Yeah. I spoke at the Surrey one to send. Is that it? I think so. Yeah. I think maybe somewhere like that. I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah. I actually know someone who, uh, when I lived in my hostel, um, she had one of the drug users was in that prison, and she had actually came across uh, Rose West, and she actually no, it was Myra Hindley. Sorry. Oh my goodness. Yeah, she punched her in the face. She punched her in the face. <laughs> yeah. How did she get access to her? She used to do the library stuff, go and yeah. collect all the books, yeah. and she said she spoke to her like she was a peasant, so she was like might be someone out there but you know in the media but you know one in here yeah so she boxed her <laughs> really yeah wow yeah that's horrific what they did it wasn't ian brady and myra handley yeah didn't they record like killing and torturing kids and stuff on the moors they from what i remember they were taking pictures as like trophies of where they left the children's remains oh. yeah are they dead now those two uh, I know there was campaigns to get one of them out, wasn't there? Ian, I think the 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 I know the man's dead because I remember Brady. it was in the, yeah it was in the news that yeah. one of the victims' mother was pleading, please tell me where my son is. All I want to do is be able to bury my son. I'm dying myself. She died. He yeah. wouldn't give it up. Narcissist oh, control, goodness. still yeah. control. That's what it's down to. Yeah, because um, are they? Is is Myra Hanley still alive? Or oh, she's dead. Oh, she died first, did she? Who was it that we had in here the other week that was visiting? Christine. Yeah, she was visiting Ian, was it? Yeah. yeah, that's it. We had a guest who was visiting Brady. Oh, okay. And the, the, they thought the media reported her as Brady's daughter. Oh, really? Yeah. It was a real, really bizarre story. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So there's various stages of adaptation. You go in, you like get the lay of the land. And for the men, you get your workout routine on, you start to get your books and your visits. Yeah. Did you have a routine for yourself? Well, uh, without <laughs> without realizing, um, as I said, like before I went to prison, when I actually got into prison, my eyes started to open. I started to realize what society is really about, yeah. you know, the class system, mm -hmm. all of it. Mm -hmm. And um you know, when you're in prison, you either have to work or you have to go to education. Mm. I tried the education, but they were like, what they did was GCSEs and then stuff that I just wasn't interested in. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. They focus on people that, they assume that all prisoners are, you know, uneducated. And I had my GCSEs and I said, I'm not going to go down there just to go do it all over again. What's the point? Yeah. Because when I come out, I'm like, oh yeah, I've got GCSEs from prison, you know, and like, there's no point. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then outside of that, there was, um, higher education mm. but because i wasn't serving long enough you have to be serving a minimum of four years because you know a general u university course is four years mm -hmm. so i wasn't able to do that either so mm. i said okay education i can't do that's fine i did a bit of cookery but it was for me to get fed <laughs> 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 so i had to do level one and level two i think it was food and health and safety then i did do some pottery mm. which i really enjoyed I, fe I found it very therapeutic like meditational yeah, yeah. i absolutely loved pottery yeah um so yeah, so I did that and then I did go to get a job. I worked for like two hours and I said, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing it. Like I decided very early, very early that I'm not going to be a cash cow. I'm not going to be a slave because they get paid for the education department and they also make money from you working in there too. We've got so many parallels. I totally played the system. So mostly I did not have to have a job. And uh, I was just reading and doing my own thing and writing my little blogs and stuff like that, trying to turn it into an educational opportunity, really. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. People were sending books in. Did you get people sending books into you or did you have Not allowed. Access? Not allowed. No. Drugs, you can buy them drugs. yourself. Yeah, because yeah, of drugs and stuff. Yeah. But the, the library had a lot of books down did there. Did it? Yeah. I spent a lot of time in the library. So you're a reader then? Yeah, What definitely. kind of stuff? Was it like stories or learning things or true life or...? Um, most of it was like, you know, made up nonfiction. Yeah. I think that's right, isn't it? Nonfiction. So fiction is made up stories. Fiction, yes. And non fiction, fiction yeah, is like sorry. the facts. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. um so yeah, I read a lot of uh, you know, made up stuff. Yeah. And then from there I was just like, 
did I kind of felt like I was reading the same thing. But gets you out the cell though, doesn't it, in the beginning? If you yeah, if you're gripped does. by some story like yeah. you're in, in Egypt or somewhere. Yeah. And some adventure. You're out of the cell, aren't you, for those yeah, hours? Yeah, yeah. But it got yeah, it got first, boring for you. Yeah, that got boring for me. And then I was like, I want to start reading. Then that's when I became very interested in, um, you know, history. Really? Like my ancestors and stuff like yeah. that. And then I came across uh, the biography of Malcolm X. Ooh. And I started to read that. And how he's learning through the dictionary and everything. I read yeah. some of that. Yeah. 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 I just read it start to finish and I was like, do you know what? He's very intelligent man very mm -hmm. intelligent and then um i don't remember reading any oh yeah and then i read about windrush the windrush generation what's the windrush generation it's the generation about um so a lot of people from the west indies as in like you know jamaica uh saint lucia mm -hmm. uh, trinidad and tobago when they all came over after yeah. world war ii to help rebuild the country and they worked through like you know they worked in like the nhs and mm -hmm. all the jobs that without being rude all the white people didn't want to do mm -hmm. <laughs> so um so yeah so i read about the windrush generation and um i knew i knew about it anyway but it was nice to read people's separate stories yeah you know um even about like you know white women that decided to marry a black man and they got shunned from each mm. each community so the black community as well as the white community you know um people getting lynched in america for stuff like that yeah yeah, yeah exactly what's crazy is that Britain was a little bit more accepting than America. It was only when they went through the war that America was kind of like, we don't do this here. Yeah. That the Britain were that Britain were kind of like, oh, maybe we should be like that. Mm. But then again, when you look at the transits, um, you know, uh, slavery uh, trade and whatnot, you go back and Britain had a lot to do with slavery too. Yeah, the railway system of the Northwest where I'm from was built on money from the slavery trade. Yeah, same yeah. as Bristol. Yeah. Bristol used to, Bristol used to hold a lot of the slaves. It was a drop-off point for them to rest and then continue. That's why we had the docks. Wow. And apparently, even under like you know uh, the center of Bristol, mm -hmm. apparently there's still like holding cells under under there. Yeah. Have you been up to Liverpool? They got like a slavery museum up there and everything. No, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't been there. Yeah. So did you read about colonialism and all that stuff? All all, all the um, invasions of the world that the British did and how they yeah. enslaved all the different countries and. Yeah, not in prison. That was more out of it. I'd say prison awoke me at yeah. that point. Then when I came out, that's I had more access to things that I actually was interested in, not things that had a snippet while I was in prison. So you're still on that learning curve now, reading more. Yeah, um, I was quite intrigued by you know the 1920s map, how much the Queen is, you know, how much the Queen owned all these countries. Yeah. Um, also, you know, with like Christopher Columbus and then there's um, Adbariya, you know, the one who overthrew, helped overthrow um, Columbus in Haiti. Yeah. Uh, stuff like that. But now I'm starting to get into, you know, like 4000 BC. Wow. So, yeah. It's going back to the Sumerians and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I did a very similar um, dive into history as you then. Um, and I found it absolutely fascinating because you're putting all these pieces together, aren't you? Yeah. And you see how it's all evolving over the centuries. Yeah. yeah. To where we are now. Yeah. And it explains a lot of things that are going on that people yeah. aren't really thinking about. How how did we get here? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's very true. Because, I mean, when you look at black history, all we hear about is slavery. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we weren't always slaves. There was something before that. Yeah. But history, the history books are hidden. Yeah. And unless, it's, you know, it's not... Is not so easy to access, it's not widely known. So unless you go and dive into that rabbit hole yourself, you don't really find it. You and then know? you get the CIA taking out people like X and yeah. Martin Luther King. Exactly. Because they're changing so many people's minds and waking so many people yeah. up. Yeah. Because I mean, in history, it's, you know, it will say that, you know, black people, that they were savages, they were uncivilized and stuff like that. Barbarians, yeah. yeah. But then when you really go into history and it's like, Okay, so where do bricks come from? Bricks come from mud. So is the civilized, civil, the uncivilization that we had, was it really that uncivilized or was it right? Because when you look at the way the world runs now, we've got global warming. So was that way the correct way or is this the correct way? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it's interesting. And they say that the earliest people were in the African region, don't they? And it yeah. just spread out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they say. Well, it's great that you um, turned it into an education opportunity then. Yeah. So in this country, it's called 
Gate fever, I believe. Did you experience gate fever? No, I didn't. I the only the only type of gate fever I had was like I would have like these little you know like like a quick electric shock in my brain. I'm like, what if I go outside and I get run over? Yeah, you know, imagine the gates open and then I just get knocked <laughs> over and I did all that for nothing. Yeah, you know. Or I don't know, a lamppost falls down and I'm disabled or, you know, I just had like, you know, little anxieties like that. <laughs> but I was never uh, ready for the, um, for what was going to, I would say prison was way easier than coming out having to deal with everything after yeah. prison. That was the hardest part. Did the government help you as a non-violent person who was involved in a drug offence? Did the government try and get you back on track? No. I rehabilitated myself. Did you? I would say that, yeah. When you went to the government for help, um, was that a hard process? So I tried to sign on with uh, DWP, Department for Working Pensions, mm -hmm. to get um, job seekers allowance, and they said no. Tried to get housing, they said no. Yeah. Due to crime, you made yourself intentionally homeless. So had I not had my mum, mm. I could have easily been straight back into that prison. Was your mom visiting you in prison? My mom visited me maybe about twice. How did that feel? It wasn't very nice because I wanted to see her more often. Yeah. But um, we never really had that conversation. I'm not sure if she avoided meeting me because she's mm. not meeting me, coming to see me because she didn't want to see me in prison. Yeah. But out of my whole time when I was in prison, the only person I was concerned about was my mom. Yeah. That's the only person I cared about and my dog. Yeah. My family came 5,000 miles to visit me and just seeing my mom after she'd been through all the waiting for hours in the desert to get in and the redneck guards and the sniffer dogs and all. And my mum just like this in the visitation room. I know. Yeah. Just breaks your heart, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 yeah she All the times that she came, she did cry a little bit. I'm like, mum, you can't mm. keep doing this because I don't like seeing you cry. Yeah. You know, because growing up, um, I mean, my mum was the heavyweight champion of the UK. So my mum's very, she's mentally strong and she's physically strong. Yeah. So like, when me and my sister would like fall over, we'd be, we'd be crying. I'm like, mm. don't cry, take the pain, don't be a pussy, you know? Yeah. So seeing my mom cry, my mom's always been so strong. Mm. So seeing her cry was like, oh, just not nice. Don't like seeing this. It's got a mess with a mom's head, isn't it? It's one thing to tell your daughter, just, you know, go out and stand up for yourself. But in such a complex situation as you were in that she couldn't get you out of, it's yeah. got to be very frustrating for her. Yeah, yeah. I think her main concern was that I was just getting skinnier and skinnier mm. and skinnier. Now, you know, one of the number, f number one things that mothers and grandmothers do, they want to feed you. Yeah. And that's something my mom couldn't do, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, that was what she was um, and my mom, upset about. And my mom, sometimes they think things like, you know, did I do something wrong with this child for them yeah. to now be in prison? Did yeah. you go through a bit of that with your mom? No, I wouldn't. Because, you know, um, I always say that, you know, I am a product of my, of my environment. Yeah. I am. I would be a fool to say that I'm not. But um, that's good and bad. Yeah. So can I blame my mom for certain situations? I could. But then, as I always say, I have the ability to step into other people's shoes. So my mom's been through some shit. Mm -hmm. And my mom was by herself. And how well my mom's done, yeah. I've got to give it to her. Yeah. She done really well. Because there's so many people out there where... They've been through less than my mum. Their mm -hmm. kids have ended up in care. Yeah. Or they've just given up, you know? My mum never gave up. My mum did, did the best she could mm -hmm. above and beyond, you know? I mean, I remember there was a time when um, Timberlands came into fashion and they were like 60 quid for a pair. And 60 quid in the early 2000s, it's a lot of money. <laughs> my mum worked the whole week just to buy me those shoes, you know? <laughs> so when I say I'm a product of my, of my environment, I mean like, you know, being desensitized to prison, and stuff like that. I wouldn't say it's bad because I have the ability to see through other people's perspective. Yeah. You know? Like, especially in terms of class, like if you can't see certain things going on around you, you know, like success and stuff like that, mm -hmm. where do you get that that niche from, you know? Yeah. And without going through what I've gone through, now I know, now I've found what it is that I want to do. And that's me working within the community. Yeah. Had I not been to prison, had I not seen some of the stuff that I seen growing up as a kid, I could have just said, I want to do something to do with money. 
I want, yeah. I want to be, I want to do finance. I want to do this. Yeah. I'm not in anything for the money. I'm in to help my community and help people that have come through situations like what I've come through. And you resonate that good energy. It's like you've got this power about you. Yeah. And some people use that power for bad. Yeah. And cause problems. Yeah. But you're like, you, you're someone who people would respect for having that power. Yeah. But you're putting it into good. Yeah. Purposes. Yeah. I just want to see everybody. You know, I just want to see everybody win. Yeah. Like, like I said, I am a product of my environment, but you can turn it into good because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people, like I always say, in the criminal justice system, there's a lot of people in it, they've gone to uni. They've gone, they're not going to understand it the way I understand it. And I've gone to uni and lived through it. So, yeah, yeah. you know, there's nothing that anybody can tell me where I can remotely judge them, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Leaving day. Um, the people you're friends with, like where I was, they come up and like the hinting, can I have this? Can I have that? Can you leave this in here for me? Things like that. Yeah. What was it like for the, the last day for you? How did the, your cellmate or dorm mates react to you leaving? Were some of them jealous because you're getting out? Were some of them like wishing you well? What was what was it? Um, I kept it pretty quiet to be fair. Smart. Yeah, I kept it pretty quiet. Yeah. Um. The dynamics, you know, at the end of my sentence, they, the dynamics were completely different from the peak of my sentence where, you know, every single person around me were good people. It started to change, you know? So um, apart from my cellmate and a few other people that I was close with, nobody really knew that I was leaving. Yeah. But the people that I did know, they said, oh, can you leave me this? Like, yeah, of course you can. What am I going to take it? Yeah. I could buy a new one outside. You ain't going to be able to get one. So yeah, of course you can have it. Do you remember the moment the guards came for you? Yeah. What was it like? I remember, um, you know, some people they they can't even sleep. I remember, um, go, I remember going to sleep and then coming to wake me up and then being like, "Oh, uh, you need to get ready in half an hour." And I remember thinking, oh, "I just want to go, I want to sleep a little bit longer." <laughs> you know, some people would be like, "Oh yeah," you know, excited butterflies. Yeah. I wasn't like that because yeah. I knew what was waiting for me on the outside of the gate. You know having to start from scratch because, mm -hmm. as I said, I come from a poor background. Everything that I've got, I've had to do by myself. No, no, no help from my mom. I was not in a position to help me. Not from my dad. Not from. I've never taken anything from a man. So I knew I got to start from scratch, and I wasn't really mentally ready for that. But once I got out of the gate, I was I was hyper. How long does it take from the moment they get you to you actually get out of the gate? Because there can be a lot of bureaucracy. Yeah. Bureaucracy. Yeah. In the so they woke me up about I think they woke me up about six in the morning. And they start letting people out about eight o'clock. And I was down there for maybe, I think about half eight, I was down there. I never got out of the gate until maybe about half past 10. Half past 10. 11 o'clock maybe. And was anyone there to meet you? Yeah, yeah, there was. My friend Shiv. Oh. That was my soulmate. And she didn't <laughs> tell me that she was coming. Oh. Yeah. So I, I came out and I was like, because my uncle was coming to pick me up to drop me to the train station so I could go to Bristol. So I was yeah. expecting him, yeah. but I wasn't expecting her. Yeah. And the thing is, good old Shiv. Yeah, she had already. Um, shout she out was on, to Shiv. Yeah, what, shout out to Shiv. This. Well done. That's so nice. <laughs> yeah, it's gold, isn't it? I mean, like yeah. mail visits, someone waiting for you. It's all magnified. It's like yeah. gold in prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. The well, the funny part is, is that she had been gone for about four months, and within those four months, seeing her, I actually walked past her. It was only because she was like, and I was like, <laughs> Shiv? You know, I didn't recognize her because she looks so healthy and, you know, prison, it draw, even the water, it just draws, it just draws everything out of you, you know? The big question on everybody's mind right now who's watching this podcast is, did Shiv take you straight to KFC? No. No. So, because my, my uncle picked me up, he took us to okay. Paddington, I actually ended up having McDonald's. McDonald's? And I couldn't even <laughs> eat it. I couldn't even eat it. Why couldn't you eat it? Because, um... Because I had, you know, my stomach's probably the size of like a two-year-old yeah, at this point. Yeah, shrinks, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So as much as I want to just, you know, eat it quick, be like, oh, yeah, that was amazing. Yeah. I couldn't do it. Yeah. Even when I got home, like, mm -hmm. to my mum's house, my mum would make curry goat and everything. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, like, four months into my sense, I would have been able to eat it, you know, yeah. had no problems, but I couldn't even eat that. Mm -hmm. So, and because I had been in my cell doing nothing, yeah. even just getting the train to Bristol, my whole body was aching because I had no muscle. Wow. Because I was so skinny. Yeah, my folks and my sister took me straight for Indian food. <laughs> um, what was it like to just put eyes on your mum in the free world? 
Um, yeah, it was nice, but it's going to sound so mad, but the main person that I really wanted to see was my dog. Really? My mocha, yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, going through court, like when I was on the outside and everything I've been through, my dog's always been by my side. And you've not seen your dog in that And long. I haven't seen my dog for it's nine not months. not that she's putting the dog above mum. She yeah. just hasn't seen. I just haven't seen my dog, <laughs> yeah. Because, of course, your dog can't come and visit you in prison. My mum did come and visit me. Yeah. So, yeah. And then when I came through the door, my dog was making the, she was making this noise where she was so happy to see me. And I just remember tears running down my eyes. Can you do the noise? She was like, ah, ah, ah. like, you know, like she was just so happy to see oh. me. And we had, we had got another dog at that point yeah. and she's running around crazy. And he's just like, why is she going so mad over this person? Yeah. But yeah, either anybody that knows me from prison will know my whole picture part was full up in my dog. Yeah. Oh. Pictures of my dog. And, and once you get around your dog, then it's like pet therapy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That, that energy coming from the animal. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So you, how long were you stayed at your mum's house for? I stayed at my mum's house until I came off of probation. That's in Bristol. Which was in Bristol, which was the following February. Yeah. And then things got really bad with my ex. Oh. And then I had to go to a refuge. You're, are you able to say what happened there? Or is that something you don't want to... Let's just say that when we had split up, mm. he wasn't happy about it, mm. and there were yeah, some let's, threats. And let's stuff let's, like leave that. let's leave yeah. it out. Let's leave it out. So, some charities helped you, did they? Yeah. And who are these good people? Solace Women's Aid definitely helped me. Solace Women's Aid. Yeah. And Working Chance. And Working Chance. Yeah. Let's say what they did to help you then, and I'm going to put links in the description box if people want to go down and support these organizations so um first of all solace women's aid you know they work with uh you know uh women that are fleeing from domestic abuse or domestic violence yep. they were the first people to say just because it's violent doesn't mean it's not abusive yeah so they helped me um while i was in the refuge they also uh you have to sign this like um, agreement where in order for you to stay in the refuge, mm. you have to do like these little learning activities where they, there's, a, there's like a domestic violence will. Mm. Well, they'll say, you know, um, like for an example, violence doesn't just start just like that, you know? It's usually, there's coercive behavior, there's manipulation, there's, you know, restricting you from seeing your family and friends and stuff like that. They don't, nobody says that that's wrong. Yeah. They say the hitting part is wrong, but they don't say that part is wrong. So during that time, they're able to, you know, there's a thing called red flags where they're like, if this person does this, this and this, they're more likely going to be a perpetrator and you need to, you know, cut it off at the earliest convenience. So they helped me a lot because now I'm very mindful about who I let around me. Because I can't afford to go for, have to go for that again, going through a refuge and X, Y, Z. As they were teaching you this stuff, were you thinking, shit, I wish I'd have known this earlier? Definitely. Definitely. Which is why I feel that police officers and stuff like that, they all need to know about things like coercive behavior. Because when I was getting questioned, they were saying, were you under duress? In my head, I'm thinking if someone's got a gun to my head or someone's forcing my hand. I went thinking, you know, has he said, does he say he loves you and stuff? Yeah, he does. If they had asked me a little bit more, I would have said, yeah, this is the case. And they probably would have said, well, actually, you're being exploited. You know, you're being groomed in a sort of way. Then maybe it might have turned out a little bit different. But that wasn't the case. So, yeah, so Solace Women's, they're really, they're really good. They're really, really good. I would recommend any woman that's in a situation like that. Who put you in touch with them? My cousin. My cousin used to work for them. Wow. Yeah. That was good. What about Working Chance? Working Chance, I had found them by myself. Yeah. So I was, I had just started university and we had broken up and I was like, I need a job. So I found, I just typed in ex-offenders. It was all men. There's so much men stuff, so many stuff for men, but hardly anything for women. And I finally found one. It was called Working Chance. Contacted them. They, you know, they did like a questionnaire. They want to know certain things. How long are you on probation? No, yes, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I had an interview with the person that would, been, that would have been managing like my job applications and stuff like that. And, um, you know, they said like, what type of work do you want to do? And I remember saying to them, I just want a job. And they're like, we don't just do jobs here. We do careers. 
you need to you need to get back into your mind frame and think you are more than just a job. We don't just find you something that not that's not going to pay the bills. We want someone that's going to pay the bills and you're still going to be able to do everything that you want to do within reason, you know? And then that's when I actually clicked in my head where I'm like, do you know what? I am actually, um, you know, I can contribute towards society. I don't just need to be doing cleaning. I don't just need to be doing this. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but if I feel like I want to do more, I should have the option to do more. And my criminal record shouldn't hold me back. Yeah. And they really advocate for that. Yeah. They've even got, um, how can I forget his name? The one that owns Virgin? Branson. Yeah. They've even got his back in. Yeah. So, yeah, they're, they're really good. Were you given counselling or therapy? Yeah. So, during my time in, in uh, the refuge, I said, because when I wrote my letter to the judge, I said to him, there's certain things that I find it very hard to say no. And even when I do say no, my yes can be turned into a yes easy. Mm. And that's that's through loads of things, being bullied and having the childhood that I had. Like, you're eager to please people, you know? And yeah. it's not hard for somebody to take advantage of that if you're not strong within your stances and saying course. no. So I explained that in the letter and I said, I'm going to do some type of therapy or counseling. And um, they, I did do a little bit of therapy in prison, but I didn't really get on with the woman. And then when I went into the refuge, I said, like, I want to continue it because I know I've still got issues that I need to sort out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I did some therapy and some counseling. This def definitely helped me. Did you meet other women who were in similar situations to you post, like they've been through a prison experience or an abuse experience and you shared things with them? You mean in the refuge or? Yeah, yeah, after prison, in a, under any circumstances. No, I didn't. Um, sometimes people, I mean, I have, know. If you've got drug problems, sometimes yeah. you get together with people with drug problems. And... Yeah. I mean, yeah, I know a lot. I mean, they say uh, every, there's going to be, I think it's like one out of every three women will have experienced a domestic abusive relationship. That's obscene, isn't it? Yeah. And so, it's even more now because of this lockdown, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I would say almost. Only one of my friends, almost every one of my friends have experienced it. Not yeah. to the degree that I did, getting in trouble the way that I did. Yeah. But it's quite common. All these pieces of shit should be making love to their women, not beating them up during lockdowns. You've got all this time to be around each other. Yeah. It's crazy. They, yeah, and they're saying that right now, there are women are at risk because of COVID. Yeah. Because yeah. I locked up with the perpetrator. <sighs> but they, 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 they do say that, one, no, two, was it two women a week? Die by the hands of their perpetrator. Oh, shit. It's serious. That's horrendous. For women who are stuck or think they're stuck, what do you say to them? I would say um, what you have to remember is, is that uh, in domestic abuse, when the woman's planning to leave or when she has left, that's the most dangerous part. That's the most dangerous time of her leaving. Is it? Being with the perpetrator, if that makes sense. Because he's going to come after you. Because he's going to come after you, yeah. So um, there are certain charities that you can go on where you can get information from. And it won't stay like within your cookies and stuff like that. So even if you're the person that you're with is checking everything you're doing, yeah. it won't. It, it, it doesn't leave a trace, basically. Yeah. So there, there is a helpline that you can call and... They have, they'll help you make a plan in order to leave the person. But, um, so I don't really want to say too much mm -hmm. because I know it is a dangerous, I don't want to get things wrong and potentially get somebody in a situation that could potentially end their lives. Yeah. So. Um, You're a very inspirational person, Paris. And thank you. you've got a lot of young people watching these videos. Yeah. Who may be tempted into the drugs lifestyle or county lines or smuggling drugs. What do you say to those people? I would say, um, I believe everybody has a talent. Everybody has a niche somewhere. Find that and work with that instead. That's what I would say. And, you know, like, like I keep saying, I come from a poor background. I know what it's like to be poor. But just remember that being poor isn't, it isn't a fixed thing. You can change that. But once you go to prison, you've got a record, it, get, it becomes even harder to change it. So I would be mindful about the decisions that you make because it can impact your future. So the young people see all these videos and movies and people have got these flash things and they think, all right, I, I want that. But if I go McDonald's, I'm not going to have that. I'm going to get into the drugs game and make that quick cash. Yeah. Is that a trap? I would say, 
Now, I don't want to come across like I'm an extremist here <laughs> because, you know, my sometimes the way I talk, <laughs> a lot of people wouldn't think that my mother's white. <laughs> but one thing I will say is that um, the media has a big platform in what they push out to society. Mm. And there are a lot of things on TV, what you read, what you see is everywhere. Black people are always, uh, you know, portrayed as being drug dealers and you can get this car and you can, no, it's a trap. It's a fucking trap. And this is why I say, don't be, don't fall victim to the system because once that's what they want. Yep. Because once you're in there and your name is there, there's no getting rid of it. And that's what they want you to do. So try and think on a deeper level where is this material stuff really worth my freedom? They That's look, how I look at it. They look at young people getting involved in drugs as suckers. They're building prisons all over the world for you guys. Exactly. They can't. They want you out doing dealing the drugs. Yeah. And, and just so they can fill the prisons up and make the money from you. The contracts right now are in the tens of billions a year. Yes. It is off the scale. Warehousing human beings, but they go after the lowest hanging fruit. It was hard to catch, you know, to catch someone like Escobar um, and the heads of the Cali cartel. The, the lowest hanging fruit are the young people. Yeah. At the peak of the war on drugs in America to fill the private prisons, they had almost a million arrests a year for weed possession. Yeah, for possession. Yeah. Possession. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me. I mean, America is, I mean, a lot of people think that, you know, like, okay, so 2020, it was quite a big, thing on terms of what black lives matters platform did and um you know a lot of a lot of emphasis went on uh you know when people in england were supporting it people in england would say oh but we don't we don't have that type of racism here <laughs> police try to know that if we had guns in the uk the police there will be a lot more killed black people in this country there's so many black people that have died in custody in england but we don't hear about it because the media don't report on it and second to that, um, my whole thing is that um, when uh, you have to remember the media are good at criminalizing people. Even if you look on my, uh, my Google, if you go type, type in my name, you'll see I was a drugs mule. I bragged about this. They're lying. Don't listen to the media. The media is the biggest tool on changing the narrative and keeping us apart, you know? And um, lastly, what I will say is that... Uh, They've always, they, they were unhappy when black people were released from being slaves. So the prison system is another way of enslaving black people. So this is why I keep saying, don't be a victim to the system. They've got black people working on the exact same plantations in America they had them working on when they were slaves. But yeah. now it's just called prison labor. Yeah, and now it's legal. They left a loophole in the constitution. They said slavery is abolished except for people convicted of crimes. Yeah, yeah. So they just criminalized the same people they freed and yeah. put them back to work. Exactly. But it's still going on to this day and it's exactly. sickening. It is, yeah. it is sickening. Yeah. I'm tired of it, yeah. I'm tired of it. This is why I want people to see, open your eyes. And um, sorry, just to uh, add a side note. No, please do. It was like, um, I heard a poet talking about, um, you know, when BLM were known for being looters and mm. whatnot. And people would say, oh, why are you destroying your own community? And the poet, the poet's, um, you know, response to that was like, but do we own anything in this community? Because mm. we don't, we don't own any of it. So why should we give a fuck if it's being burnt to the ground? Mm. Because when you remember back in the day, black people had their Wall Street in America. And what did America do? They bombed it. So do you want us to, um, you know, self-elevate and work our way up um, independently because another thing that people complain about is things like the Equality Act oh then why should I have to help them because they're black well we actually helped ourselves but you keep destroying it mm. so we need it in law so that you don't do it again you yeah, know yeah I saw a cop say to make my arrest quotas I just go into a black neighborhood it's like shooting fish in a barrel yeah 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 it's like, um, I'm not going to say which which is my local station, but in my local station, when I was still working, at least three times a month, I would come up the escalator. And this is this this is the irony. This is one of the points I wanted to touch on as well. Um, so, you know, like the Stop and Search Act, PACE, that was originally put in because of football 
hooligans, mm. right? And I live near a stadium. And when I come in from work and there's a football match on, there's probably about five police officers and there's loads and loads of people because they're going to watch the game. But on a normal day, like say twice a month, there's maybe about 15 black men pushed up against the wall and there's about 40 police officers mm. there. So I'm like, so you're doing all this just to find drugs, but where the original, um, you know, where the act originally came from, you're not even using it in the right context. So what's it really for, you know? It's all, it's all about this and the contracts, um, revenue generation, yep. filling the private prisons, yep. and on and on and on and on it goes. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's obscene. Um, are there any other things you would like to say to the audience before we wrap this up? Um, no, nothing, not really. Um, I am planning on doing my own podcast at some point. Brilliant. Um, but... I need to, like I said, I don't want to come across like an extremist, but I am about elevating my people as in people that come from the same background as me. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, just black people. That means people come from the poor background. So I would like to do things where, you know, um, I'm going to try and educate my community in terms of like the pace um, on what terms a police officer can stop and search you, you know? Um, so things like that, I just need to figure out what content, what kind of content I'm going to be pushing out. So that's my way of trying to help the community because I could keep saying, I don't care about money. Yeah, I care about equality. <laughs> you're on a mission and you are a great communicator. Thank so you. So you're ideally suited to do that. Thank you. And you talked about the media and all the stupid bullshit that they put out. You are the new media. You were the new media when you went on Delinquent Nation. Yeah. <laughs> you're the new media here today. Yeah. So many people are going to watch these podcasts and be influenced by what you say. Yeah. And they're going to, you know, kids these days, their TV is the phone. They're looking at you on YouTube. They're not looking at the BBC anymore. Yeah. Because they know it's just all BS. Yeah. Yeah. So people like you can start your own podcast and just take over and just, yeah. just, just show this new generation what the truth is. And that's the hope. Yeah. I mean, my like I say, my main thing is to educate people like me where I come from, but then also like, you know, coming from the background that I've come from, you know, the the racism that I've experienced, it was traumatic for me. But outside of that, my mum's background is no different to mine, white or black. So I feel like the sooner we all realize that we're all in the same boat, that is not a thing of race, it's a thing of class, that yeah, of course, race keeps you behind on certain things, but we're not the elite. And the elite keep us down for a, a specific reason. You know, and one of the ways is by don't like Muslims, don't like blacks, don't like this, don't like that. So the sooner we all realize that we're all in the same boat, I've got more in, in common with somebody that's Polish than I do somebody that's gone to a private school, then I think we can move forward in society and become better people. Well said, divide and conquer, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a powerful podcast we've had today. <laughs> um, before I show... Um, you the Arizona prison handshake with my coronavirus preventing glove on. I'll just give the closing credits. Um, huge thank you to everybody who's watched this today. Uh, <laughs> Paris has absolutely been on fire. Um, honestly, your energy just just rose and rose and rose throughout this whole <laughs> thing, and it's it, people are going to be mesmerized. Um, like I said in the very beginning, delinquent nation. You know, huge shout out to you guys. Mitri, AKA SP, <laughs> would love to get you on to tell your own story if you're up for it. And would love to speak to you about some of your guests anyway. So hopefully we can get that connection going. Um, I'm putting in the description box, the links for Solace, Women's Aid and Working Chance. Cause it's, it's very important that we support these organizations. Cause look at the impact it has had on Reese's <laughs> life. Yeah. Um, huge thank you to Joe and James for coming out today in the freezing cold and, and filming this. Um, we were supposed to have Pepsi Watson on this morning doing part three, but something intervened, let's just say, and he wasn't able to make it at the last minute. So that was a shame, but we're hoping to have him on here really soon. Huge thank you to all the new subscribers. 
in the last few days, we just blew through 600K. And um, I think we're almost at 630K just in a matter of days. So all the love and support that's coming in from all over the world to support this mission. Our mission statement is end the war on drugs, take all of those resources and start the war on pedos because those predators cause so much harm. There's so many people we have interviewed um, and people I met in prison and they, the, the reason they're doing the heroin is because they were abused as kids. And it's, it's, it's sad I thought, you know, heroin addicts, lock them up, throw away the key. But living with people with addiction issues for almost six years and hearing the sad stories of abuse thrown away as kids, um, living on the streets, didn't have parents or seen parents die, someone molested. And here's me with a good education, good family support, a business studies degree. I'm thinking, shit, you know, what excuses have I got for committing my crimes? And it just made me feel doubly guilty. And that's what launched me was becoming an activist was out of that county jail in Phoenix, Arizona, when we started writing everything down, ex exposing what was going on in that jail. And what you've said today shows the UK side of exactly the same thing. Yeah. The evil of these companies mm -hmm. turning people into commodities and doing it under the umbrella of the war on drugs. That's how they fill the prisons, non-violent drug offenders. Because before the war on drugs, to go to prison, you had to hurt another person. If you go back centuries, crimes were rape, robbery, murder, where person A is harming person B. And that's how it should be. Those people need to go to prison. When you arrest a young person with some weed, who's that person hurting? Exactly. That's not what prisons are for. No. That person needs some mentorship. Like you said earlier, you know, when you realized you'd been manipulated and you were actually a victim of what was going on. Yeah. There could have been an alternative to this. Exactly. Holistic. Holistic. Yeah. You're a strong person. You've got through it and you've come out even stronger. I could tell you're on this mission, but a lot of other people who d wouldn't have had your strength may have think, right, I'm in here, I'm stressed out, I'm going to get on the drugs. And yeah. the situation could have got a lot worse. And that's what I saw. Yeah. They get these, they hand these big sentences out and they're thinking, the only way to deal with this is to, is to do the drugs. I, I had an abusive childhood. I did drugs to hide that pain because, and I'm on the heroin because it blocks it out. Now I'm in prison and be treated like an animal got a long sentence, you just doubled my pain. So what am I going to do? Even more drugs. Mm -hmm. And you know, these people know it's, a, it's, it's slow suicide and they end up dying. So I really appreciate Priest coming in and just, you've dovetailed with what I've been saying over the years with your own mission. And you've confirmed a lot of things. It's good to hear it from another person and to, to amplify this message um, worldwide. So a huge thank you to all the new subscribers. It's free to subscribe. Subscription logos in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Huge thank you to people who've gone down in the description box and clicked on all of our other links. All our socials are down there, all our donation links and all of our playlist links. We're at almost 150 podcasts right now. Things slowed down over December, but by February, um, thanks to Joe and James and the guys up in Liverpool, we hope to be doing um, publishing two back to publishing two a week again monday nights at 6 p.m and i think we're going to do the other one thursday nights at 6 p.m all right so arizona prison handshake is you just shake hands like this and then like that and then you bump it oh. <laughs> <laughs> cheers everybody thank you for thank watching you. take care